Hello and welcome to another episode of the Underhive Law Keepers podcast, the number one Necromunda Law podcast recorded in my garage. As <laughs> always, I am Spamuel, and joining me, the mass migratory manvent himself, Nathan. Uh, hi. Yeah, ha- happy to be here in your garage. <laughs> well, you know. You say that, but we all know you're not really that happy. How are you, buddy? <laughs> I'm good, mate. Mass migratory. The alliteration is just uh, on point today. Well done. I, I am running out of M words. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just don't call me Mambit. Hmm? Think about that. No, that would be offensive to you and your people. You are right. I, it was a test and you passed. Congratulations. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> How are we? Yeah, good, mate. Good. Uh, just kicking along. Um, enjoying our pod um, and doing some silly stuff in preparation for Akramunda. But oh, I didn't want to jump straight into this, but you forced me to segue into it. Now, when we were recording that Bolter episode, yes, sir, you said that you were starting a new gang, and Steve begged me to stay on topic, and I did. But Steve's not here now, so. What have you done? Well, I like to consider myself a bit of a genius, and I've had a moment of genius. Okay. So what I have done is I've taken an Escher Zinchian gang that I've been working on for months on end now. Yep. And I put them on a shelf. All right. Okay. And. and I'm not going to take them to Akramunda, and I'm actually going to take one of the gangs that we came up with, that I came up with um, in one of our other episodes. I believe it was episode two, where I put the little nugget of a thought inside my brain to have a Admech Explorator team hitting the surface of uh, Necromunda, and them going off and exploring through... The, the vast Detroitus that is left on on Necromunda and finding a bit of um, Aranean technology, which then influences the gang. Yes, yes, yes. Your um, oh, what was like the the almost Cybernak fella? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh. So, um, against all good thought, I've been researching components and parts to to build this gang and then researching lists and unfortunately my girls who I love and I'm a servant of um, have been given the uh, the back seat for the moment um, I'm super inspired to do this gang and I'm going to base them off a, a obviously the Vansar because they're probably the most uh, technologically adept uh-huh. which makes me feel a bit filthy it makes me feel uh-huh. like I'm wandering down a pathway that you like which is not great after all the, you're a filthy Vansar. Uh, I'm Admec. I'm Admec. I'm not Vansar. I'm just simply using a tool to first, get me to where I need to be. Firstly, my brother, welcome to the glorious house of Vansar. And uh, you've made an excellent choice. But I, I do have one question here because I don't yes. want to start yelling at you uh, this early in this episode. Um What is wrong with you? When this episode is released, we are four weeks to the day until day one of Akramunda. And you're just like, willy-nilly, don't worry about the Esher. I've been working on on them for months, and they look awesome. And I'm just like, no, I'm just going to do some ad mech. No, why not? I'll say my my theory is is that I'm gifted with great skill, ability, and drive. Mm. And... If I can tap and into apparently those. apparently great amounts of alcohol. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, and, and stupidity and just a general sense of red balloon syndrome. I'm just like, oh, uh, my God, new gang. Need to do it. Yes. Uh, Which you you suffer from as well. So don't even start. Uh, the amount of time. Just for the wider <laughs> audience, the amount of times I've had to stop this man when I get a message going, this is my new gang and I'm doing this and they're going to be amazing. And I just have to send something back saying, please don't. Stay focused. <laughs> Stay, on yeah. Stay on target. Stay on target. Let yourself down and you'll let the people <laughs> around you down again. <laughs> okay, you're not wrong. You're not yeah. wrong. Okay. So I'm... that's that's where I'm at. What about yourself? How are your little grey 
grey murderers, are they still looking up at you, wanting to get just a, a lick of paint on them? Uh, <laughs> so, um, next question, please and thank you. Um, <laughs> no, no, my squats are still unpainted. Um, I have uh, been working a lot on my trader guard, and I've also been working a lot on video games. So there's not been a lot of getting my game ready for Akramunda, but I need to. As soon as we're done tonight, I'm, I'm, I'm building... I, I need to do more squats. So I'm assuming you've been playing Hired Gun then or some Necromunda video game. Is that correct? No, no, I've been playing <laughs> Fallout 4 um, because to me it is still 2015. Yes. And I'm a child. But <laughs> it just does strike me as the, the true lead up to a tournament, as any player should be doing, procrastinating and just going, well, I've still got three weeks. And three weeks is more than enough time. And then when you get down to three weeks, you go, mate, I've done a lot in two weeks. So then mm. you go two weeks. And then by the time you hit the night before, you're like, look, I'm I didn't have time. time. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have time. I just didn't have time. The things caught up on me. You know, it was, oh, they're relentless. Life was I, relentless. I specifically remember a bunch of us playing Warhammer 40K and... I think both me and your brother were still putting things together that morning. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember that. Oh, yeah. We were at Steve's house. We were just yeah. like, yep, okay, I'm just, I'm just quickly putting together this guy's basement. Yeah. All right, cool. The whole squad's done now. Yeah. Oh, okay. I need to do this guy's heavy weapon. Okay. No, yeah. Cool. Cool. All right, done. Yep. The counts um, because I remember that because it was an apocalypse game and we had given ourselves over six months planning to get to this game. Yeah. And we all turned up woefully unprepared. I mean, if you show up prepared to any game, in my opinion, you've uh, overcapitalized on your time. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, move, moving on from uh, standard sort of hobby behavior within our gaming group. Um, yeah, so look, I mean, we're on, we're on course. We're just, just stopping at every stop along the way, we'll say. Okay, so you're playing Admech Vansar. Um, Excellent. are you going to be going heavy on the Admech range? You're going heavy on the Vansar range? Admech. It's, they're going to basically look like an Admech, uh, squad for use of a better term, but it's a, like this, you're clearly going to be able to define the prime and the Archaeotech and, and so forth and Neotech and all the rest of it. So, yes, uh, the plan will be to use, well, the plan is, cause they're currently assembled is to have my guys equipped with Vansar weapons. Just because at a tournament you want to just give as much advantage to your opponent as well by saying you don't need to have a full and comprehensive depth and knowledge about my law for my gang. You just need to understand that what the wep what you see on the weapons there is is what you're going to be fighting against. Because yeah, and, and that's a that's a different conversation about tournaments about you know just being nice to your opponent and just going I'm not going to be a uh, a prick for use of better term. Don't don't be a prick is an excellent uh, yeah. sort of mantra to take into um, a tournament of any description. Yeah, or any game, really. But, um, yeah, so I, I've set myself a challenge, and it will get done, and it'll look sexy and cute and popular to boot. Excellent. Well, by the time this episode's released, like I said, you have four weeks. Mm. You have four weeks from basically right now, to get this <laughs> gang built and painted and based and ready to go. And, uh, thoughts and prayers, people. Thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers. <laughs> um, well, we have everyone's favourite segment here, and that is the Spamuel Corrections. And we only have two. We only have two, which in Yay. my well mind is insane. That's actually, like, we'd consider that a bit of a win, wouldn't we? Well, most definitely, especially young Nathan, seeing as the first Spamuel correction is about you. Go on. And this has come from surprisingly many people, and it is in regards to your pronunciation of House de Lark. Oh, yeah, righto. And I'm, I'm not going to name who said this, um, 
like I said, it is a lot of people, especially myself. Uh, well, you sound like a snooty Frenchman when you say Delacroix. <laughs> because I pronounce it correctly, Delacroix. Ah. There we are. Uh, I can see why we have so many listeners in France, though. Um, <laughs> and like one of us. Yeah, one French of us, Cana- for sure. French Canadia. We've yeah. got a lot of them there as well. I think there's a French connection in UK as well. I, no, I get it. <laughs> I, I, I get it. I'm just upset. What are you upset about? I'm just telling you what I've seen in our analytics. Jeez. Well, that's the first one. So please, yep. please stop pronouncing it that way. Okay. No uh, more. No more Delacroix. I promise. No more Delacroix. From when, from whenever I say it, I'll say it correctly. Delacroix. Zero. <laughs> Done. Uh, the second one actually comes to us from a listener by the name of Stuart. And... Stuart pointed out that it actually wasn't a correction, but sort of a, almost a, a avoidance of information where we had, we were speaking in regards on the Escher episode to the, to Adina Sabine, the matriarch primus of house Escher. And we had said that she was actually a clone that although was correct, uh, we also implied that she was effectively cloned and then grown in a test tube and boom, baby. In reality, she was a clone of Vodicia, as we said it, but she did have a, a living human birth mother by the name of Tynus Sabine. Now, Tynus Sabine was the previous matriarch primus of House Escher before Adina, uh, before she had effectively been seen as no longer fit to rule. Uh, so for anyone who sort of misinterpreted what we were saying there, we weren't saying that Adina was just a straight up test tube baby. Uh, she did have a real mother. So, you know, thanks for Stuart for reaching out to us and sort of saying, hey, sort of skipped around that. Uh, yeah, but. Right. Yeah, so we've only had one real spaniel correction, and it was about Nathan. So it's they're good numbers as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, right. Okay, I don't consider it a, um, a correction, but yeah, sure. Go on. <laughs> um, and okay, this one's a bit of a surprise. Um, Nathan, do you remember how many listens we had when we recorded the Escher episode? Oh, from the top of my head, I'm thinking it was about 1,000? It was 1,085. That's right, yes, 1,085, yep. And as of right now, while doing the recording for this episode, how many listens do you think we have? Mate, I haven't looked at those analytics. Please. It's, been, it's been about a month. I'll say it's yep. been about a month. Yep. Uh, I don't know, another 700 or so? As of right now, it is 2,417. Oh, my God. In, in a month, we have gotten about an extra 1,400 listens. And That's fantastic. I, That's brilliant. Yeah. I, I, I just don't even know what to say. This, just, this is insane. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've, I've mentioned it before, Ed, just from where you and I came about with this idea of just having chats, like taking our chats from our drive homes or whatever, or just sitting down and talking about Necromunda, and to have that turn into what we're currently doing is just mind-blowing and just amazing. And I, I, I genuinely hope that we provide inspiration for other people, but... Also inspiration for other people wanting to do a podcast. Like just, mate, we, we, started, we started with zero knowledge other than our nec- our love of Necromunda law. Mm. And we've turned that into something that we really enjoy doing. And obviously our community enjoys listening to as well. It's, it's insane. Mm. It's, it's, it's like you said, we, we would just call each other on the way home from work. Be like, hey, man, have you read this book? It's got a really cool thing about Escher. Hey, man, have you read this book? It's got a really cool thing about Imperial Guard on Necromunda. And you just, yeah, we just started recording it and putting it on the internet, yeah. having these exact same conversations where yeah. we're coming up with ridiculous gangs and ridiculous scenarios and, you know, 2,400 listens or downloads yeah. or whatever later. And it's just, I, I can't believe it. I genuinely can't 
believe well, it. I'm, I'm looking at it. I can't, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't believe it. It's, it's inspiring for us. So for all those people who are listening to us and and the people who reach out and make contact, mate, that's, I love that. I love the fact that we're able to have a chat with people, like-minded people as well. But it is, I find it very inspiring. It makes us want to continue on and do the next episode or come up with the next idea or just even as we're reading about something new, speaking to each other when we're not recording and just being like, oh, my God, have you seen this? Or, or like, this is this is something new. And when you see the new stuff from Warhammer Community come out and the chats that are being derived from that in conjunction with what does that mean for our podcast have, have just been brilliant as well. Oh, 100%. It's... It's insane watching this hobby of ours grow and just being a part of it, just mm. being a part of it, even in some small way, shape or form. And within the community as a whole, just seeing everything grow and the, just people just reaching out, like you said, and just sort of saying, hey, man, I listened to uh, this episode and I really liked this or what did you guys mean by this or where did you find this information? and just just these conversations and mm. the, our, our audience gives us so much through this and I would like to give something back to them. So I think we're going to run a little competition. Cool. And Very good. I want to make this really difficult for someone to win. Uh, so I'm thinking... Like us on Instagram. Buddy, come on. Stand nice and easy. Oh, that's and easy. Then, <laughs> yeah, that, that's the easy part. Yeah. And then here's the hard part. Every time we release an episode, there's an Instagram post and it gives a little breakdown and what to expect. Just on that post, tell us what gang you want to start. Nice and easy. Whether it's you just say Goliath or Nomads or Escher. And then we're just going to randomly pick someone wherever they are in the world and just send them that gang box. That's, that's, a, that's overly complicated, though. It, it, it is. It is. I, I, I fear we've done too much. So, we've asked too much. You know what? If that's, that, that just means they've got to be dedicated to be able to win it. So, <laughs> True. yeah. Like, just follow us on Instagram. Um, Comment on the Instagram post that comes out with this episode. And a month from now, we will announce a winner and they will just get the gang box of their choosing sent to them. Cool. Sounds like, like a plan? Sounds, sounds like a brilliant plan. So very simply, from this, from this uh, Instagram post for this episode, you like it, then you add a comment about which gang you want to play and uh, take it from there. And then we'll, we'll randomly select a winner. Yeah, so don't worry about where you are. We'll, we'll get the box to you. Yeah, it's, 100%. Yeah. Unless you're in the Antarctic, I don't, I don't think they accept mail. <laughs> Let's strap it to a penguin. Easy. Okay, I've got a gang idea. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard of bomb rats. <laughs> yeah, bomb penguins. Bomb penguins. Actually, that's surprising. I wonder if there is... Like, oh, we've seen the, the map of Necromunda. I wonder if there is, a, like, an, an Arctic or frozen yeah, area. Man. Yep. There is. Uh, I believe the Northern Hives are... That's right. I remember surrounded by about snow, this. But the Northern that's... Hive doesn't exist, remember, because of oh, the uh, immortal right. cult. Yes. Um, but, cool. okay. Winter Necromunda. I'm glad you've done that amazing segue there. Talking about hives. Nathan, what's our episode about today? Our episode today is about hives and about all the great and wonderful places in, in Necromunda in which the uh, citizens live. So we are going to go down a little bit of a pathway of exploration about these hives and just dig deep and find out exactly what goes on in particular hives. And uh, through that process, hopefully be able to give us a little bit of inspiration. But we, we do acknowledge in our research that... Uh, we need to sort of focus on one or two hives at a time. I think anything more than that, um, it sort of just does, does a bit of a disservice to, to whatever subject we're talking about. Um, and, but I think more importantly, what we're trying to get across is the setting 
of where people would be hosting their campaigns, the setting of where their gangs would originate from and what that means to their gang, how they, the, the type of hired guns they would have, the, um, the type of aesthetic they would, they would have on their, not only on the miniatures, but also on their bases. And that's, that's a big talking point for me yeah. about bases. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and terrain. Yeah. Yeah. Terrain. Look, I mean, I'm, I'm very big on display bases and so forth when you go to tournaments and they have to look all hunky dory. But when, when you, in, when you capture the moment of a miniature on its 25 mil, 32 mil, whatever size base you've got it on, your base is what helps you create that sense of atmosphere for the miniature. Yeah. You know? um, unless you're doing source lighting or something like that. Like that's a whole different type of atmosphere, but the base. Okay, let's not talk about source lighting. I haven't <laughs> yeah. converted my game yet. Yeah. I'm not hitting down source lighting. All right. Yeah. But the, the, the base is, is what helps you get a, an understanding of where that miniature comes from the, what their, what their fight is, what their struggle is, you know, um, a, a prime example I have is a, um, is an Astra Militarum army that's all urban bases. And so when you look at them, you're like, oh, my God, these, these, these troopers are slugging it out, you know. Um, and yeah. the, and the, same, the same can be said for something that's just as simple as a desert base. You know, people go, oh, it's just a bit of sand or whatever. But it, if, you, if you do it right, and I've seen it done very, very well done on, on certain gangs and certain armies that I've seen, that you really feel like this, this army is... Oh, well, this gang is fuel, purely encapsulated within a in, in desert war zone. And it makes it look awesome. See, it doesn't necessarily need to be over the top. It just needs to be something that is truly reflective of where that gang is fighting and what they're doing. Yes. And that's, I, I love the fact you've said about the desert bases and that sort of thing there, where just something as simple as uh, texture paste and mm. sand and, you know, or rocks and stones, or you know, we've all thrown a skull or two on our bases in the past. Yep. It it lends a, a lot more of a story to your miniature beyond just this is my Orlock with his shotgun. This is my Van Sar with his long lass. You know, yep. you take that Van Sar and you build a little bit of a an urban ruin in front of him. He's hiding behind, you know, the destroyed ruins of a settlement or. Uh, your Escher Wild Runner is jumping over impromptu spike traps, and all of a sudden, it's not just the dynamic positioning and painting and everything that makes the miniature itself. The base is adding to that story because your miniature, although it looks fantastic, looks so much better when the base itself is adding to it. Not just, yeah. not not just. Don't get me wrong. I love the plain plastic. Necromunda bases. Yeah, like, they're great. Yeah. For for a guy like me, they you can you can get a whole gang's worth done in, you know, six, seven weeks. Um <laughs> as opposed to, you know, in reality, you if if you knuckle down, you could get fifteen of them done in an hour if you really wanted yeah. to play around with it. Um whereas you look at some of the things people do on their bases and it just adds so much. And that I think is where the the hives themselves come into the play because mm. and everyone knows you know uh the the that grim industrial look that Necromunda has where it's the sector mechanicus terrain or it is you know it's tunnels and the ash waste and that, but expand upon that, expand upon that terrain, and you know you can. You can really start telling a story with just your story. You can tell a story from where your actual gang is from. Hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. When you're talking about those simple Necromunda bases that you get, you can take one of those bases and as simple as adding a little bit of a clear resin or something like a water effect on them. Oh. You're talking about um, a gang that's fighting in the some sea. You know yep. what I mean? So you yep. can just, you just add these tiny little elements and go, that is, that is my point of difference. But, I mean, moving away from the bases and more to the larger scale of it, the, the actual environments in where you fight. Um, and this is it, it's something I've talked to you about before in the past, and I will reference Warhammer 40,000 again here. 
when we play games of Warhammer 40,000, you've got, you know, let's say anywhere between 30 to 50 models on the table. Yeah. Right? So the, the imposing presence and the actual presence on the battlefield is created from the army. The, the, the battlefield's important, but it needs good lines of fire and all the rest of it. In Necromunda, if you're putting 10 models on the table, your gang is quite large, you know. Um, so the actual environment that you're fighting in becomes really important to the story that you're telling. Um, yeah. and, it, and it's not just about blocking lines of fire and all the rest of it, but it's about saying that the, 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 the gang itself doesn't have enough presence on the battlefield to, to make it look like a, a battlefield. For use yeah. of it as a, you know, what I mean? yeah, they're going to be ones and twos and whatever, um, but it's the it's the actual terrain that helps give it that sense and depth of where you're fighting and what you're going to be fighting against, and you know all the different avenues and the the, the terrain sets you can get are brilliant, but adding the personal touches to relate them to the hive that your gang comes from or yes. the hive you want to be fighting in, or if you're in the ash waste, and um, I spoke to you the other day about this there's a great table a display table from um cinderac burning uh in page 116 117 of that oh. book and uh, mate what a oh. beautiful that legitimately not only makes you want to play a game on that but it, you start to look at it and you start to think how would my gang be pressing on this area do you know forget the mission forget yes. what, what they think but if they were just trying to push into this nomad town, how would they do it? You know what I mean? And you begin to look at all, and that, I mean that's the absolute top tier level because that's a display table. But I'm saying for this hive episode, what we want to talk about is the hives themselves, how you can reflect that in your battlefield. You know what I mean? So, well, not even just the battlefield, but also your gang. Mm. Like you know, we everyone knows hive primus. Hive primus is the melting pot of Necromunda. It's our capital. It's where so many of us base our gangs from. Uh, but there are so many other hives that have stories that are just as good. And in some cases, uh, especially the first one, or the, sorry, the second one we're doing, yeah, I think the story and background to it is even cooler than Hive Primus. Oh. Um, 100%. For me, uh, since we've been doing this podcast, my two favourite hives are Gothril's Needle and Hive Secundus. Oh, and man. There's just oh, so oh. much going on in both of those hives. Like, Primus just sort of feels... Like, there's probably there's 10 times more going on in Primus, but because it's such a, a large thing to have to digest, there, there's some really clear narratives within the other hives that you go, I can, I can properly digest this and I can actually formulate it to create a gang from, develop some beautiful looking bases for them and to, to develop a terrain set that is, is, is orientated around the, the narratives within those hives. Now, just before we maybe get some people's hopes up, I know a lot of people have asked when are we going to do an episode on Hive Secundus? Because we talk about it a lot. Yes. Today is not that day. No, it is not. And um... I, I do, I do apologise for mentioning it, <laughs> but it is genuinely, since I've read about it in more in depth, it is, it yeah. is my favourite. And it's coming. It is coming, folks. It so. is coming. But the first Hive we're going to touch on is one I personally think is insane uh especially given the current state of campaign books but we are talking about hive mortis now nathan you love hive mortis especially because of what it eventually turns into so why don't you take this first part here for us like the great domestic houses that rule them, Necromunda's hive cities can rise and fall in their fortunes. Hive Mortis is a victim of its own success. Once an industrial linchpin of the world's equatorial hive city clusters, it enjoyed great fa favour among the planetary elite. Its high yield of machine goods brought its rulers wealth and, and an enviable place among the imperial tithe standings. Millions of workers once filled its tunnels and domes with the ceaseless sound of their toil, while the great houses fought over the fruits of their labour. 
The first shadows of disaster were subtle in their coming. A sickness that slowly infected the underclasses winnowed away their numbers. At first, the deaths were lost among the attrition of the work plans, discounted as seasonal spikes in mortality. But soon, even the housemasters could not deny their meaning. Plague had come to their hive city. When word reached Lord Helmore, his reaction was swift, and hive mortars were sealed by imperial order. For years, the plague ravaged the hive, and soon the dead outnumbered the living. In the chaos, the great houses strove for power as they fought bitterly over what was left. As battle raged, whole sections of the hive had, be, had to be sealed off. Tunnels stacked floor to ceiling with corpses. Eventually, the sickness abated, having burned itself out after devouring more than 20 million souls. In his benevolence, Lord Helmore rescinded his order and allowed, allowed the hive city to open its gates once more. I mean, it's a little worse than your uh, winter sniffles, but <laughs> Absolutely. This, this was what was known as the Mortis Plague. And as we know, Hive Mortis was the former home of House Aranthus. Now, it's rumoured that the Mortis Plague was a gene-crafted contagion loosed by Lady Ania Helmore for some dinner party slight. That's and right. do you remember, I think it was episode two, we were talking about this, mm. um, that the members of Aranthus started dying off across the whole world. And so when the house came together in Mortis, remember we were talking about it, they were doing the Medicaid rituals. And yeah. I was like, they were sucking the bad blood out of them and putting good peasant blood into the, them in return. But mm. instead of them getting rid of the sickness, they just made their citizens sick. Their yeah, they spread it tenfold. Sick. Yeah. Mm. And Mortis just started to die because of it. And that, it's that, uh, that line you read there, tunnel stacked floor to ceiling with corpses. Yeah. Or yeah. how the dead outnumbered the living. And that's horrifying, even for Necromunda. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but speaking from... Uh, I guess from a noble house point of view, the, the, the most horrendous line in all of that that I read was the fact that the production begins to slow down. <laughs> that, that's where, as a noble house, you'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm, I'm happy. Kill 20 million people as long as production maintains. And, and as, as I read, they, they, they were envied, envied for the fact that they were able to, I assume, surpass their imperial tithes. You know, just constantly manufacturing, constantly manufacturing. So they they now have a scenario where their people are dying off. But you, and you see it in there. Their people are dying off. They're like, doesn't matter. Production's still up. Yeah, it's part yeah. of seasonal mortality rates. Sure, right, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd love to know what, what season is it where they're just like, oh, <laughs> a bunch more people die. Oh, yeah. It's June. Happens every year. Oh, yeah, yeah, June. It's, it's, it's not true. A great yeah. <laughs> yeah, the old June mortality rise, like clockwork. Yeah. So it's it's very interesting to see. So the the history of what we're talking about here with Mortis is that you have this this shining star, this shining light, and it is the machinations of nobles and so forth on Necromunda that bring it down. Because we know the Mortis plague is a manufactured plague. It's not. It's not something that just happened. Which, going, by, going from what you just said there about production, hmm. here's Famuel's theory of the day. Go for it. Um, the dinner party slight against Lady Anna Helmore. Hmm. I have a theory that it was a member of, High, of House Aranthus who said something along the lines of, oh, yeah, we've got the best production on the entire planet. Hmm. And this has gotten back to Anna Helmore. Mm. And she's gone, you know what? I'm going to get these bastards. Yep. And so she's gone to her gene crafters or she's gone to the, the poisoners that she knows. And she said, okay, here's a sample of the blood of House Aranthus. I don't want them to be there anymore. Yeah. yeah. And it's purely because, you know, this, this member of House Aranthus has said the truth that, oh, we, we happen to have produced more last gun power packs than you last cycle. <laughs> not anymore. Uh, so you're, because... what you're saying is sort of, it's not a personal slight. It's, a, it's an actual 
slight against their um, their capacity and their ability. Yeah. Yeah, it just right. happened to be that they produced a couple of boxes more power packs than the yeah. Helmore funded yeah. manufactoriums. And so, you know, Anna's gone, you know, as House Helmore are like to do, she's pulled a Helmore and mm. killed an entire hive of people. Yeah. Um, you mentioned this a couple of uh, episodes ago. Uh, they're all trumped up gang leaders at the end of the day. Yeah. And yeah. this is this is some real gang leader mm. type stuff. This is a mafioso. Mm. We're going to kill the family for slighting us by, yeah. by a joke. It might have just been an offhand comment said between you know quote unquote friends. <laughs> yeah, definitely not friends. Um, but furthermore to that, like you you think about it, right? Um, and this is this is a slight offshoot from what we're talking about, but uh, it's just germinated in my brain now. Primus protects itself all the time. Yep. Hive Primus and the Palatine Custer protect itself all the time. So Secundus, Secundus goes the way of the dinosaurs because it gets a gene steal infection. Oh, yep. okay. How convenient. Mortis, which is the envy of the rest of the planet, gets a, a plague infection. Oh, how convenient. So these other houses that potentially could become more powerful or could become, and I, I, I doubt it would just simply be a simple uh, election process of like, you're now the new imperial house. Every time they stick their noses above the water, there is something that not only just cuts that nose off, but it buries them further deeper and just goes, you, you, we, would, we would destroy an entire hive to ensure that we are the recognised imperial house here. Do you remember I said it a couple of episodes ago? Like, oh, what? I think it was episode two, episode one, where they're basically saying, well, hold on, we produce more, we manufacture more, we're able to take a hold of the hives. Why aren't we the Imperial House? And that first part you read there, um, it enjoyed great favour among the planetary elite. Its high yield of machine goods brought its rulers wealth and an enviable place among the imperial tithe standings. Yep. It, 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 it's amazing the fact that that first line of that reading, um, they can rise and fall in their fortunes and Hive Mortis is a victim of its own success. This is yep. why I stick to my theory. The House Helmore destroyed House Aranthus and in turn Hive Mortis because they proved that for just one minute someone was better than them. Yeah, they can destabilize your power. And um, it's it's not a, a it's something that you and I talk about endlessly and something that has just I I've even said this to you is is draw me into the Necromundan law more than anything else is the idea of industry and production on that planet and con consequently like how it works across the whole Imperium. But they are saying that any any motion or any idea that works against what they've established is is more dreadful than any sense of power in the terms of a militaristic sense militaristic sense sorry any sense of um, direct conflict that all those things are all passable because the true great fear the the I guess the 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 sword hanging in the middle of the night. Is, is the Imperium. If yes. the Imperium decides that you're not meeting your requirement, they'll come along and switch, flick that switch off for you. They, they'll you, go, no. You have no defence. Yeah. If the Imperium decides to flex its little finger against Necromunda, it's good night, Irene. They're done. And, and it's not... The, they, they won't destroy the planet. Why would you destroy a production facility? You yeah, will destroy the ruling family. Or, As they have done several mm. times before, the Imperial Fists have cleared mm. hives. They've cleared house. They've cleared house Helmore, where yeah. they've said, put it down the middle. Yeah. You guys get to survive. The rest yeah. of you, out in the wastes. Yep, yeah, exactly. So this is, and I, again, we, we want to talk about how, how hive mortars, but I'm telling <laughs> you now, <laughs> this, there's a real, and it's an insidious darkness uh, that is like we talk about the the unrelenting and painful environment that is necromunda but this darkness about everything is just about production on necromunda that i find 10 times more appalling and 10 times more evil 
you know. But at the end of the day, it it maintains the war machine of the Imperium. And without the war machine of the Imperium maintaining, Necromunda would surely fall. You're not, you know, you're not going to have a Xenos species rock up to Necromunda and be like, oh, well, you know what, we'll, we'll keep your production going, we'll keep your humans alive. No, they're going to no. wipe them out. So it is, it is sort of like a, a, a real s- disgusting symbiotic relationship where the Necromunda needs to feed the Imperium and the Imperium needs Necromunda to feed itself. But at either sense... If, Necromunda, if the Necromundans and, say, Halmors drop the ball, it's game over Red Rover. They'll have yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Well, Hive yeah. Mortis still has its place within Necromunda's infrastructure. Um, it's no longer, you know, it no longer has a high yield of machine goods. Hive Mortis is a changed place, and it now thrives no longer on the creation of machines, but rather the industry of death. Now, with the massive human resources gone, the ruling great houses turned to the only thing they had in abundance, the dead. Mortuary cults were created and manufactoria turned to the harvesting and breaking down of corpses. House Escher has risen to dominance among its clan house peers in Hive Mortis, extracting and fermenting drugs from the bodies though their death-maiden gangs do not go unchallenged. The houses still fight just as furiously as they did when Hive Mortis was at the height of its power, though the tempo of battle has changed. Small communities shelter in the empty vastness of domes and levels constructed to house millions, their citizens still fearful of travellers and the return of the plague. Gangs rove this wasteland of hollow hab blocks and abandoned sectors, fighting over vaults packed with corpses or else trying to force their way into sealed chambers to plunder the desiccated wealth within. That is insane. <laughs> it is. It is. It is bonkers. And there's so many thoughts that come to mind when I think about this. And I'm just going to reel off a couple. Hopefully we don't forget to talk about them as we're inclined to do. End of days, apocalyptic, zombie style hive. Now. Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> so glad you mentioned zombies. <laughs> um, it's it's like Europe after the Black Plague. Um, just this emptiness that exists. Yeah. The other thing that I want to mention: you mentioned video games earlier, um, and I, I, the main game that I play is um, Dark Tide. So, Dark Tide. If if anybody ever gets to play that and look at just the environments in there, the the how big they are how small oh, and inferior yeah. you feel within that environment. Now, that is exemplified a h- probably a hundredfold within Mortis because Mortis is um, empty, you know, for use of a better term. And the idea that they're wary of travellers, I love yeah. that. They, it's like, it's that, um, that whole... You, you don't belong here. Why are you here? That fear of a stranger that's come back where they're almost sitting there saying, we don't know this person. We want them gone. And if you don't leave, we will make you leave. Yeah. Um, but that, that line there, small communities shelter in the empty vastness of domes and levels constructed to house millions. Yeah. Like, you just imagine... Um, do you ever see that Kevin Costner film, The Postman? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For those of you who haven't seen it, picture the other very famous Kevin Costner film, Waterworld. But instead of on water, it's on land. And um, Land World just wasn't a great title, so they named it The Postman instead. <laughs> but these uh, little communities have basically built walls around themselves mm. and they've turned into... Um, these little little islands in the sea of nothingness that is, you know, existence post-apocalypse. And that's how I picture these communities where they're like, you know, they, they might let you in uh, one at a time to trade, but they, they've got a, a rogue doc out there who takes your temperature and bleeds you a little bit and, you know, real you know, classic uh, plague doctor look, you know, the black yeah. robes, the long mask. Yeah. That sort of stuff. And it's we think of Necromunda as such a populated thing where Hive Mortis, I think it would, it would be, it would be barren. It would almost be, um, 
you know, your marketplace will have four stalls, one of them selling, you know, rehydrated pumpkins, one selling rusty knives, and the other one selling you a ticket to get the hell out of their town. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it's it's very interesting that what you mentioned about the vastness and the emptiness of it, um, and you you can get a scale of that, I guess, in a real world environment. If you ever see a place that is normally just packed full of people, and you ever go to that place, so say like a sporting ground or something like that, and it's empty, yeah. and you what you begin to get a sense of there is actually how big that place is when there's when it's not full of people. It yeah. suddenly looks like this monstrous large thing, and that's what I imagine these hives would look like. The, the, the scale of how big they are and exactly like how uh, overbearing they are on humanity would just be exemplified. So you would have these small clusters, and I, I've, I've got lots to talk about with the small clusters of people. I've got some questions for you, and I want to get your opinion. But yeah. just the, the scale, um, that scale would surely be defeating even just the people in there. It's like, you know, Oh, yeah. Yeah, because you, you look, talking about walls the size of titans and, you know, just the, the concept of that you would be looking at your community and you're going, where we are right now, we can't, we can't fathom the idea of building a wall that tall or building a machine or an operating system that can open a door that large because we just don't have the manpower, we don't have the intelligence, we don't have the, 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 the technology available to us. But it's not even just that. I think these people would be looking and, you know, you've got a community of 30, 40, 50, 60 people, whatever, and you're looking at it and you go, okay, so there's, let's say, let's say there's 100 people in this community. Yep. And we're looking around, we're going, okay, there's, a, there's 100 people here and we take up this much space. But if I climb onto the walls and look out the tower there, and I look around our community, I can see these other communities that just don't have people in there. Where mm. have they gone? Like, because, you know, people may not necessarily remember why they're scared of outsiders. They just remember that they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was another thing I was about to ask you. Like, it's a good segue into it. So this idea of a road dock and this idea of a community, but the the essence of that community is all about surviving, right? Yeah. So they, they're no longer, and we, we talk about it in the read, that it's no longer built around the idea of let's, um, let's manufacture more goods or let's use our industrial might. It's, it's purely about using the, the corpses to, it, to create something. But it's more a sense that they're just trying to survive now. They're, there's no longer an idea that they could ever grow to become something more powerful or something more, I guess, uh, uh, impactful on the hive. They're yeah, yeah they're, they're now purely just survival. And that's what I was going to ask you. So you're talking about this weariness of strangers and these rogue dogs and they're looking around and they're seeing these empty hives and they, the, there is a chance that the plague is a myth, is a legend. You know what I mean? So... Yeah. And there could be other there, there there could be other reasons as to why our hives are empty, you know. So as the as the people reading the the established law and the history, we go, oh, your hive is empty because there was a plague. But the truth of the matter is that within the hive, there could be stories that are manufactured, like you know, don't don't go out of the gates at night because there's demons out there, and there's actually that's yeah. why the hive's empty. It's full of demons. Man, that. That brings up some very cool thematic ideas for, like, terrain and building boards and... Oh, you've, you've broken me on that one. <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of like, it'd be, it'd be cool to do, like, a four-by-four, four, like, walled-off town with little habs and that sort of thing yeah. within it. Absolutely. Um, and for any of the veteran players out there, I'm going to make a reference to uh, Mordheim. So oh. I'm, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming a lot of players out there who play Necromunda have de certainly dabbled in Mordheim. And if you haven't, go have a Google. and It's a brilliant game. But Mordheim was described as the city of the dead. And it was uh, just in a perpetual dilapidated state. There was so many things wrong with it. And, and the worst of the worst came to Mordheim. And that's what I imagine Hive Mortars would be like as well. 
it would be the absolute worst of the worst trying to find the, the the strangers coming in would be the worst of the worst trying to find their fame and fortune because anybody who's successful in their own hive isn't going to go to a potentially plague infected hive to try and find their fame they're they're going to stay away from it because they're already successful where they are well i like the fact you've uh talked about mordheim there what was mordheim called the city of the dead and Hive Mortis is obviously a dead hive. Yeah. And we actually talked about some dead people just then. <laughs> and I think we've both sort of glossed over it a little bit. Yeah, I've just said, as I said, I don't want to miss some of the points we're talking about. <laughs> um, House Escher having death maiden gangs, entire gangs made up of death maidens. We joked about that in the Escher episode. Yeah, I know. I remember that. <laughs> did we accidentally create a Hive Mortis campaign? I think we did. I think somebody's been listening. <laughs> but what you've said there, like the worst of the worst would be coming to Mortis because it's almost – you can survive anywhere. So mm. my mind, if you've got these Death Maiden gangs, because we know Hive Mortis is a – Uh, an enclave it's a stronghold city for house escher and they're yeah like we read before like they're they're making drugs they're building entire industries on the bodies on the corpses and possibly upping their numbers just with dead and defeated enemies to make more death maidens yeah 100%. 100%. So they would, and it, it goes into another thing. So they would be upping their numbers because they're going, okay, well, you know, if people die, our tech, our chem tech is actually coming from how we're, we're drawing it out of these bodies, these dead bodies. So we yeah. spoke about it before, like, you know, you want to have a death maiden gang, you, you have an apprentice chemist and so forth in there. These would be, there would be a ridiculous amount of strength and power within the chem side of uh, House Escher. Also, you can't imagine them using a lot of Xenos beasts to draw their, their chems from. They would be drawing it from the dead bodies. So you're talking about different chemicals that can be made. They're talking about refining and creating experts in the field of how to create death maidens. Yeah. So um, you begin to dabble in a different sort of uh, technology and a different sort of chem technology. But... This gives you such a cool way to to build Escher gangs where um, in House of Blades it goes into some of the enclaves that it, from uh, the House Escher and it talks about the girls from Hive Mortis and um, there's a line in it here. Gangs of wild girls clad in bone white war paint and ghoulish costumes support the maidens. These are the girls of the dead wild, and Hive Mortis is their playground. Bro, I Scrap need the that gang. Let's <laughs> scrap the Admech gang. Just found a new gang. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! I oh my love their that bone white face paint. They would look absolutely terrifying. Yeah. So it talks about how these death maidens rule vast areas of what was once Hive Mortis's hive city, and these wild was it the dead wild. Yeah. They, and after all the conversation we had about wild runners and how basically they're just murderous teenage girls. Yeah. You can imagine how insane these girls would be in a place like Hive Mortis, where mm. there's there's no one in charge except them. There's no yeah. nobles left there. The place yeah. is the place is dead. Yeah. Like they you you can't get into the spire. That that bad boy is locked down. We need to we need to follow him. No, by the way, that's oh, a, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. that's a very um, important one. Yeah, that but, is that is very important. But <laughs> these these wild runners are they're in they're truly in the wild, but mm. they're in the hive, and yeah. it's 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 mental how the just some of the the story ideas, some of the modelling ideas, just yeah. a campaign idea that has come 
just from this concept here. Yeah, hundred percent. Like when you talk modeling ideas, we'll go we'll venture forth back into the campaign idea because the campaign idea is freaking awesome. But the like even the little beasts, the um, I never take them in my games. The uh, the cat, not the cats, the the lizards. Um, the the Stegosaurus cats. The Stegosaurus cats. That's it. Um, Mars even cats. Though, yeah, even those could be modeled and created differently within within the gang. Do you know what I mean? Um, they don't they don't have to look the same. You could create something that is a some sort of beast that has just been feeding on corpses. You know, so it would be oh, a different yeah. a different nature to it. Phalanxes. Um, They're called phalanxes. phalanxes. It's just a word. I knew I didn't want to mispronounce it, but and it sounds silly. Um, but the the, the thing you don't want to mispronounce and sound silly. That's the thing. Okay. <laughs> it's pronounced Deliqua. Anyway, um, <laughs> the the phalanxes could be modified and made to look different. And and this will venture forth into the idea of a, a campaign. There is still lots of talk about with Hive Mortis as well, just in the in the law side of it. But in the idea of a campaign, you could have the sense of what what the ever present sense of death does to your gangers, the ones that so you, if you have a gang that has come into the hive, how that ever ever present sense of death, how that affects them and afflicts them, it might take them a few fights to become more adjusted to their environments. Whereas gangs that are already established within hive mortis are just like, oh yeah, this is this is Wednesday. That's fine, you know. Yeah. We're, we're, they're literally corpses that look like they're shuffling and moving, but no, that's just that's just the other encampment. They're, they're there are also spot. corpses that are shuffling and moving. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need to come back to that one. Yeah, it's true. There's zombies in there as well. But so the the way that the gangs and the operatives and even the production would function within Hype Mortars would just be so different. Like the people who grew up in that hive, the people who were never, ever going to leave hive mortars, this, this idea that they live in an empty hive surrounded by corpses oh. with a true and utter fear of all outsiders and no, no real sense of imperial rule in, in, within that hive. It's all about just creating corpse starch, I imagine. Yeah. Corpse starch and drugs. Yeah, of course, um, some drugs, yeah. I've just realised, do you remember the old Warhammer fantasy law on Sylvania? When, no. Uh, no. Oh, man. Because uh, obviously with the, the Von Karsteins and the vampire counts, um, they still had human peasants and servants. Oh, and yeah. Sort of thing. And yep. you'd read some of the stories there where characters would walk into like a tavern in Sylvania and the, the, the locals are just staring at them like, why are you here? Yeah, it, yeah, right. It's it's almost night time. You can't go outside. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. Um, that's kind of how I'm picturing these communities in Mortis, where you're absolutely right. The the people who live there to be like, oh, this one goes, oh, what's all that screaming? They're like, what scream? Oh yeah, I can hear that now. Oh no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone probably went you know, too deep down the wrong street in Timmy Town and unfortunately got chewed on. Yeah, right. They, but, you know, these new gangers are like, what do you mean they got chewed on? It's like, yeah, you don't, you don't go into Timmy Town at night. Who, has no one told you this? Yeah, exactly. Like, it's just, that's, it, it is the, absolutely everybody knows that's the unwritten rule. You don't go there. Yeah. But what you just mentioned there about, you know, ending up in a place where, there's all these horrors that the locals know about. It gives the opportunity to create horrors, the very much like the skull, like, you know, the beast of the skull, yeah. um, this giant supposed orc thing. Imagine the type of monstrosities that would exist within Hive Mortis. Imagine a rogue doc who has just decided, I'm going to start stitching things together and pump electricity to them and have yourself a Frankenstein in in hive mortis, you know what I mean? So you have these these gangs governed by doctors, but it's all just like like automata. I hate you so much. That is awesome. I think it's a cool idea. But it's you have this these automata that are just flesh golems, really? Like they've just been constructed from the corpses and put together. Um 
And so it's just like, yeah, we, we create these things. Or you could genuinely have horrors, horrors in there that are a combination of warp energy. And imagine a dead psyker in Hard Mortis, never knew it was a psyker, was just really good at cards, but then is reanimated through the gifts of Nurgle or through some other warp energy and now has become some truly horrible, like horror movie style beast that well, exists within that hive. There was my main man, Karloth Valoy from N95, who go. was the uh, psyker who got bitten by the plague zombie. Um, I want to go back to your Frankenstein abomination gang because do you remember the um, Galapox? Was the Galapox oh, infected or great whatever? Great set of miniatures. Phenomenal. Um, yeah, those, Galapox. Those yeah. big fat ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, where they had like the furnaces on their bellies, they were, yep. they almost looked like they were stitched together. Yep. Um. Oh man, I've just got this idea. I'm like, I could use him, mm. and you'd heck it. You wouldn't even. You would need to do nothing. Just build well, a gang around that guy. That's that's perfect. In fact, I'm looking at it here. He's got. There's another one. Um. He's got like two heads stitched on, and he's got like these vents coming out of his back. Oh man. Oh, man. <laughs> Good idea. I, I imagine you like it, do you? <laughs> oh, I'm so angry at you. We are four weeks away, sir. Four <laughs> weeks away. Um, Good. Join me on oh, the pathway to damnation. <laughs> you, you need to talk about something, another gang that is in Hive Mortis, because I, I'm about to go on a whole rant about plague zombies. Well... That's my next point, is that you have the miniatures within the, um, the pox walkers from uh, the Death Guard range. You have those miniatures you can throw in. Anything that looks like a zombie, you throw in. And this is for the Arbiters running your games. Be expansive in your ideas for how you want this plague to look like. Right? You have something that is so unique to this hive, tap into it. You know, Make rules for it. Make it difficult. Make it overbearing. Make it, you know, last year's, uh, the last Akramunda we were at, and we had the, the zombie plague that they hit us yeah. with. And that was really cool. But when, when I played it, I was like, oh, this is really awesome. I would actually like to play more games of this. And Hive Mortis creates that opportunity. And as I said, if, if I, just, okay, quick offshoot. Um, if I was arbitering a if I was a good campaign runner, I can't even pronounce that word, arbitrating. Arbitrator? Arbitrator, Arbitrator, that's the word. Mm. Arbitrator, yeah, got it. (laughs) Um, If I was the arbitrator of a game, I would make all the gangs that are playing, none of them would be locals to hide mortars. Yeah. And so, you know, things like affecting their cool, affecting their leadership, needing to be close to your buddy at all times, you know, the lights being off 24-7. Like, that's another thing we haven't even talked about. They produce Corp Star Trek, where, like, the maintenance of the hive is a completely different thing that we haven't even mentioned yet. You know, where, how are they keeping the lights on there? How are they, uh, how is the water running? You know, what, what are all these things that are happening that would normally be maintained by the guilds? Are the guilds in there? And if the guilds are in there, what do they look like? But as an arbiter of a, a game or a campaign, I would be saying the, you want to create that level of fear and, you know, every noise, every kick in the shadows would just be oh. terrifying for your gang. You know, you just... And, and like, night fighting would be such a just a common thing that you would go, yeah, night fighting equipment, we have loads of it available because the, the locals here, they know that they need it. To get from one side of the hive to the other, sometimes you need to do it at night and you're not going to do that just relying on your wits. Yeah, drop the rarity on some of that stuff. Maybe, yeah. um, maybe put it into everyone's, uh, mm. you know, beginning armory or even mm. you just say, like, Everyone, everyone gets uh, photo goggles or yeah. respirator. Yeah. Um, oh man! So, so I'm on the Games Workshop website. <laughs> uh, dangerous, dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm looking at the Dead Walkers zombies from the Age of Sigma range. Yes. Now you change out a couple of weapons. Um, slapper. 
an auto pistol on someone's belt, and they're obviously not going to be using them. But you have the perfect bad guy for a campaign mission right here, yeah. where these are the victims of the Mortis Plague come back to life. Yep. And, like, we've talked about running a mission like this a couple of times where, you know, you've got your gangs on one side and you just have this endless horde. You've got to roll 2d6 and that's how many zombies are showing up. Or d6 plus one or whatever. Mm. That's how many zombies come up from the opposite edge of the battlefield and are just making their way towards you. Mm. Um, Oh, we should play that but, game this yeah. weekend. Yeah, but that's a that's a great scenario to play because you can and uh, they did do this at Ark where you um, had two gangs fighting side by side. You know what I mean? You're trying to stop the 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 zombies overwhelming you, um, but you also have your own secret little missions in there as well. Like, yeah, you, you don't mind if the other gang gets left out here on their own some and they all get eaten by zombies because. That's a, another set of bodies for you to come back and loot, and it's also um, a lot less competition for you within the hive. Mm. So, well, I mean, as I said to you, there's so much to explore within Hive Mortis, just even outside the realm of the 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 tabletop about how to play the game. But it's all those elements that that bring it together that make you go, yeah. how much? How much do we? How much do you to try and invest inside? your campaign and inside your gang. Um, but I, I still have my questions about Hive Mortis. And the other one that I wanted to mention to you is about the strangers, right? So how do people... Is, so it is now a... It's now an open hive. Elmore said, yes, go for it. We, we're back in business. We understand yep. they're not producing anymore. They're producing corpse starch. And that's a whole different... Another topic of conversation as well about their production of corpse starch. Um, so how these strangers are coming into Hive Mortis. Who are the strangers coming in? How are they gaining access? And how are they, you know, how are they accepted within here? Because we, we, we've, you and I have talked personally outside of the pod about the nature of a hive and the fact that the bottom level is almost like open access, but not completely open access. So you still have the tunnel entrances and so forth where the, yeah. um, the shoots come through. But who are they allowing into Hive Mortis? Well, I think it would be... It'd be a mixture of your classic migrants, where mm. you've got people who are just trying to get out of wherever they are and go somewhere new. And there's, a, there's an advertisement basically just saying, hey, come to Hive Mortis, you know, free room and board. Um, don't, mind yeah, right. the, don't mind the zombies. Um, right. So you're you're telling me one one uh, group of people are people who are looking for a better future. Yeah. Oh, you know, Jesus. they, they yeah. just ignore the um ignore the double doors that are chained open, that uh, chained closed. Yeah. Um, saying you know don't dead open inside, and they yeah. can't figure out what it means. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, I think I think you'd have a mixture of just classic migrants. Mm. You'd have. Forced transplants, so you would there obviously would be noble houses coming in. There would be clan mm. houses coming in. We know it's not just the Escher who are here, mm. um, and they would be bringing. You know, if the Orlock come in, they'd bring in drudges. They'd bring in. You know, their quote unquote quote prisoners with jobs. Um, mm. Yeah, okay. The the noble houses would be bringing in their retainers and their peasants and their sort of worker populations. Yeah. Um. But also, you know, what you said before, going back to Mordheim, it's your worst of the worst. It's yeah. your soldiers of fortune. It's your treasure hunters. It's your mm. um, wanderers. It's the dregs the of all yeah. sorts of societies so then, coming in. How are, they, like, how are they vetting these people or these, these they're, gangs? They're not. They're you not. don't think so. You think absolutely. So you not. think you think the 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 individual settlements themselves would have to vet them, but Hive Mortis as a whole is not vetting the people coming in because the settlements wouldn't like if you've got a settlement of say, you know, a hundred odd people just purely surviving within Hive Mortis, they're not going to allow you know fifteen well gangs you know, in. 
Well, that's the thing. Your gang comes in. They're saying, well, firstly, you're, behind, you're outside our walls. Why should we let you in? Mm. And yeah. if, you know, your gang shows up and says, well, we can help defend the settlement. We can, um, if, if it's a Van Sar gang, hey, we can help power your settlement. We can help, you know, mm. we can put cameras up and TV and, I don't know, Street Fighter arcade machines, whatever <laughs> it is they, they need to get themselves inside the walls. Um, you know, your Orlocks are coming in and saying, well, we, we can help manufacture. The Goliaths are coming in saying, well, you know, look at the size of us. <laughs> you let us in, we're kicking down the walls. <laughs> yeah. um, there's, everyone's going to have a way to get in. And mm. I, think, I think you're right there. I think it's the individual settlements mm. that are doing mm. the bedding. Um, mm. Like there's, there's obviously going to be that suspicion of strangers and outsiders, mm. but I, I genuinely think it is going to be a, a, a settlement on settlement. Yeah, so settlement by settlement. So I, as an overarching thing, the, the hive is saying the doors are open, please come and fill our hive. Yeah. Um, but the... Hell more wants his money. Exactly. Yeah, it's it, and this this actually leads us perfectly. I've got, I've got a few more theories and qu- questions about the other stuff, but it leads perfectly into the idea that they're producing corp starch there. So we we've mentioned it heaps already, but they're producing it. And my understanding is the main producer of corp starch is Hive Arcos. Am I wrong? It used insane? to be. Oh, yeah. That's where okay. the uh, corpse grind is took yeah. over. Remember, yeah. they buried that bad boy in sand. That's right. So, now, this is a couple of different points about production of corpse starch. The, and I've referenced this before, a great story about uh, in the Necromunda book I've read, Underhive, I think it's called. Yeah, um, the, uh, the compilation book. Yeah, compilation book. They talk about the mentality of somebody working on a, on a, a corpse starch line or a, a a, yeah, a line where they're basically breaking down the corpses and the man has to get his, his... His daughter becomes part of the line as well. And one of the things that he says is that you, you never get used to it. Huh? Um, he was told when he first started working on that production line, you're going to get used to it. It'll just become part of your norm. And the, the idea is that he never gets used to it. Whereas in a place like Hive Mortis, death is, is not just within the... the the confines of that production facility, death is everywhere. Absolutely you know, everywhere. Mutilated bodies, rotting bodies, you name it whatsoever, they're all there. So the, the people who are working in those facilities would be of a completely different mindset. Now... They'd be completely numb to it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they're just like, it's not even about getting used to it. It's just like making sure that we get X amount of corpses off the street and process them. Now, that brings me to another question about the idea of these corpses rotting, are they still being processed into corpse starch? If they are, that's yucky. Um, it'd be a mixture of, like it says, um, the breaking down of corpses and bodies. Mm. Um, whether they're being broken down into corpse starch and basically just, you know, grind it up, mixed up mm. together with whatever bodies they can find, turned into a delicious nutrient brick and then shipped out and sold to the population. Or... If the Escher are coming across a body and saying, hey, the, uh, the pus leaking out of this particular body is a different colour. That's weird. Let's take it back with us and see if we can make a poison out of it. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, it, would, that. it would depend on who's getting a hold of it. Yeah. Um, you know, are the people maybe grabbing the bodies and using it to feed, um, you know, their giant rats that they're then mm. training to, you know... They're strapping plasma grenades to and sending them into <laughs> local gangs. Yeah, um, yeah, it, yeah. I think it really would depend on whoever finds mm. the body, what they're going to do. Yeah, with. okay. Yeah, all right. Yeah, because that, that was something that sat in my head. I was like, well, these, these would be rotting corpses because we're, talking, we're not talking about a death plague that happened over the course of a couple of years. We're talking, it's, you know, decades. Decades yeah. of death yeah. happened. Um, well, 20 so, million bodies. It, yeah, you're not you're not harvesting them all in a day. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly that. Um, yeah, right, cool. And that again, I mentioned it earlier about the idea that how does the the hive function within a um, I guess 
a, a mechanical sense for use of a better term. So, you know, how do they keep the lights on? How do they keep the water running? How do they keep the airflow going? All of those things. You would have very, very specific uh, guilds that would need it for that. And those specific guilds, you would imagine, would have to be permanent residents within hive mortars. Well, the, um, the Mercator Paladis, I believe, is the Corpse Guild. Um, mm. They 100% would be involved mm. very heavily in Mortis. Mm. Um, yeah. That being said, you would still have all of your other guilds, you know, the... Ooh, test my memory. The Sanguis uh, being the yeah. Slave Guild. Uh, yeah. They would be bringing in slaves to work the... Um, mm. the manufactoriums or the groups of them just grabbing the bodies. Uh, you've got the, the Temperium, um, who is, I believe, the Air Guild. Mm-hmm. And with their airships. Be, with their Zeppelins. Yeah. Um, they'd obviously be get, making sure there's air to places before you go there. You've got the, uh, the Electro Guild. I know this. It is the Lux. Uh, yeah. because you're going to need lights. Yeah, you, know? you need power, you need lights. Yeah, it's all, it's all those things that, like, when you talk about a decimated hive, it's all those things that can be get easily forgotten about because you go, oh, well, it's a decimated hive and, you know, they're still able to reduce. But from what you're saying there about bringing bodies into the hive, for me, it strikes me that hive mortars could be very much like a um, a penal hive or a punishment hive. Where yeah. it's like, okay, you know, we we'll round up X amount of criminals, and we have, you know, a hundred thousand criminals rounded up from X amount of hives. You get, you have to go spend ten years or twenty years in hive mortis as part of your punishment. You know, so yeah. you're, you're, or you've pissed off the local um, yeah. member of your clan house's noble family, and mm. it's all right, Manvin. Um, we have seen what you've been doing, and you know what? You are heading to Mortis to mm. just, you just live there now. I'm passing you on to another gang. Yeah. And it's right. like, oh, okay. Well, what if I don't want to go? Okay. But <laughs> no, uh, you're still going. You're going. Um, you're either going as part of the production line or as part of something that's been broken up on the production yeah. line. Yeah. It, it also, in my mind, there's also those ones who are going to be wanting to do it just for the fact that there isn't that many people there. It's going to be cell swords. It's going to be the ones mm. going over there to take advantage. And our Goliath, I mentioned them before, you know, mm. let us into the settlement. We're just going to kick the doors down. Um, the Goliaths of Hive Mortis, uh, they're actually known by other Goliaths as the dead boys um but a really cool thing about them we know house goliath are big on their forges and their making of you know armor and knives and axes and all that sort of stuff in hive mortis um the goliaths don't have forges uh not traditional forges anyway they the Goliath gangs inside Mortis, actually, they're nomadic and they travel from settlement to settlement, from dome to dome, from level to level. And these guys are insane. Like, this, this, this one here, I believe it came from uh, House of Change. Uh, armed and armoured against adversity, the dead boy Goliaths are survivors, favouring reliable weapons such as axes and shotguns, to see off plague zombie swarm attacks or Escher night cycle raids. Their gangs are made up of skilled monster hunters who adorn their armor with grisly trophies, zombie hands nailed to furnace plates or dripping shifter skins turned into cloaks. These grim displays are in part to scare the other gangs, but mostly to prove the Goliath's strength and show that nothing Hive Mortis can vomit forth frightens them. This yeah. is the type of ganger that is coming to Mortis voluntarily. Yeah, okay. Hard nuts, basically. The hardest of nuts. Like, right. they, 
the, the axes and shotguns that yeah, they're that's using cool. to fight zombies. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's real um, oh, apocalypse now, like when they had mm. the, the necklace of ears. Mm. Um, yeah, very much so. Yeah, these Goliaths—they're cutting off zombie hands and nailing it to their arm. Also, what is a? I'm guessing it's a shapeshifter, a dripping I, shifter skin. I was going to ask you because I just googled Necromunda shifter and I couldn't find anything. So let's the guy with a spanner. Yeah, um, just, <laughs> just, I'm just a mechanic, mate. You're yeah. a freaking dead zombie. Die. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Harry, if he was a zombie, why did he talk? Shut up, Grom. <laughs> Yeah, you'll be a zombie next. Um. <laughs> um, like the, these dead boys. That's yeah. that's awesome. And and you, you know, painting them like you go for really morbid looking colors and darks and horrible things, and just like you know, the the weapons would look very basic. So you're not make having an axe on them that looks like a beautifully. Um, uh, manufactured axe or anything like that. You're looking at almost like a cleaver, I think, would look really cool. And the shotguns would be bare bones and, you know, they, they would just, I, I think they'd be a great modelling po- project. Oh, and going back to Age of Sigma, um, the Auric War Clans, some of their weapons where they've got those dirty yeah. big cleavers and they've just got like random jagged sections of metal coming out or yeah. those... um. Oh, they're the brute rages where mm. they've got those big that there's that bloke with that big double handed like sword where he's holding it up halfway and it's got stuff like that. That's mm. how I envision these dead boys. Yeah. Where yeah, you're absolutely right. They're everything is gonna be very simple, very basic, easy to maintain. Yeah. yeah. Um, but just brutal. Yeah, and it they they would and there's something you mentioned about them though, which I think is really cool. They move from settlement to settlement, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's something we haven't mentioned about hive mortars that is only just dawning on me. There is a real sense of freedom within hive mortars as well. Yes, you can move around. You're not stepping on people's toes because, as you say, it's an empty hive, and you've got these cell swords coming in there looking for opportunities. So. Like, you know, Escher are obviously the, the dominant clan there, but you can actually move around the hive. You can go to different areas, and if you're canny enough to survive, then you you have a different level of freedom and a different level of lifestyle that no, like that wouldn't exist on any other hive in Necromunda other than maybe Gothral, you know? It gives almost a... I love how you use the word freedom there. Yeah. Um, it's no, a level no, of freedom. It's a level of freedom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you're absolutely right. Like, you'd almost have, and I can just imagine this this plan of Goliaths traveling, mm. you know, from settlement to settlement mm. or level to level, or they're just going deeper and deeper and deeper into the underhive. And mm. they're, yeah, they're digging up manufactoriums and claiming what they can and taking it back to the next settlement and selling it for, you know, they trade it for corpse starch or whatever. But it, I think it would lend such a cool modeling opportunity in the fact of more of your guys are going to have uh, backpacks and yes. they're going to be they're going to be carrying everything they have with them. Yes. Um, where yeah. I think it's not something we see a lot of where because you know if you're living in Primus or if mm. you're living in the Needle and that sort of thing you have a certain degree of, I can just go back to my settlement. I can just go back to where I live and do what I want. And you know the, uh, the Ash Waste upgrades kits you can get from Forge World yeah. where they've got those backpacks and mm. uh, the Goliath ones, they're these big chem packs and they've got ammo and grenades and that sort of stuff holding off, for, like going off them. That's that's a great use for stuff like that for your foot mm. troops, where uh, they've, they're funny. I think I'm looking at them right now. They've got like the, the shifters, <laughs> the, yeah. the, the these bunch <laughs> of they do, do, yeah. don't they? Yeah, um, but stuff yeah. like that. But also, you can you can model these guys up where because and I, I'm talking about these Goliaths so much, but it works for anyone. Um, where maybe you're not showing as much skin because you don't want to get they're scratched or bitten. You don't want to yes. be exposed to these plague zombies. 
um, yeah, right. or these shapeshifters, or yeah. you don't want to, because that's just what we know of. It mentions on that um, reading from uh, House of Chains uh, further up that uh, plague zombies, carrion swarms, and far darker things stalk the shadowy domes of Mortis. And we're not just talking about those Death Maiden gangs. Um, we we don't, like, this is where your Frankenstein idea from before mm. comes in great, where that crazed rogue doc has mm. stitched together these different corpses and he's or he's stitched together these these ogrins and mm. he's created monsters or he's stitched together an ogren and a dead goliath and yeah mm. three dead mars cats and has made a three-headed mars cat ogre ogren uh <laughs> goliath um you know but yeah. that sort of stuff it's insane like i would love to do this i've just i think i just started a goliath gang um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, lots of chain mail, lots of amateur. chain mail would look sick on yeah. it. Yeah, so you uh, put like chain mail down. You have like even leather plating. It doesn't always have to be something. Yeah, stupid. which is highly protected. All of them wearing gloves, like you know, and not go- not just gloves, like gauntlet gloves. So right up to the elbow, sort of thing. Yes, um, neck protectors, stuff like that. All these things, that, and they would look incredibly more bulky as well. Yeah, um, but, but, and you obviously then got those grisly trophies. You've got uh, yeah. hands ha- hammered to them. You'd okay. Um, where I said before how it's like uh, they they drag their massive smelting cauldrons, where yeah. they they're nomads and they're dragging these portable forges. Um, do you remember Scrag the Slaughterer Absolutely. from the uh, yeah. Ogre Kingdoms or Ogre Moor Tribes as they're known now? Mm. Um, do you remember how he was dragging that pot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's my idea for a slave ogren for this dead boys gang. You take Scrag the Slaughter or the Slaughtermaster as he is now, and you take those chains and you attach it to a slave ogren, and you have him dragging, and you turn that into a forge where mm. um, it, it's instead of the, the pot... It's uh, sorry the the soup inside the pot. It's molten oh. metal, yeah. And that's you know, like, and from that, these these dead boys would be, um, they, you'd be they'd be throwing in all captured weapons or broken weapons yeah. and melting or any down. scrap that they find. Yeah, yeah. And just creating forging, another set of weapons. Yeah, or, and it's forging armor, and so they've got oh. this crude, almost like orc hammered metal around them and it would be it would be crude and it would be um like real it'd be it'd be poorly fashioned mm. but it, it allows them enough movement that they can smash into a group of plague zombies and even if they get grabbed they can't if they're really gonna have to try and fight to get at their skin. And yeah. like oh Yeah but like extra spikes and all this extra yeah. stuff that would that make them look like decidedly Goliath, but at the same time, also very much natives of Hive Mortis. No, not to say that they are natives, but they they they've adapted their 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 way and their, their method, whole mindset yeah, to to fighting within Mortis. Yeah, and then and I, I love the idea of what you said about like the backpacks and giving them a sense of freedom because there's no they can't just stop somewhere and top up and resupply there's no hq for them to run back to or anything like that no. so the idea that their forge comes with them as well yeah is just each, freaking cool each night where they've got to set it up and then mm. the the blacksmith is saying all right everyone bring your weapons over let me have a look no nah, yep we're gonna mm. sharpen that axe no nah, yeah nah, that 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 nice useless mate go know, on go straight it, into the melting pot and it, it almost becomes this ritual into the forge, yeah. you know, you know, from yeah. it, it's it's done so much for you, but it's failed now. So we're going to give yeah. it new life, and it might become a machete or an axe, or yeah. you know, you can you can get really deep into this story of your game yeah. just with little things like, like, you know, you can create your own law. It's yeah. it's almost like this is what we've been telling people, um, <laughs> but that they 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 find a settlement where. You know, obviously it's empty now, but they, yeah. they find or they find a building and they 
you know, they're post guards and you sleep now, you eat, you know, yep. and it's it's this wandering almost um caravan of Goliath. I was about to say it, yeah. caravan. A caravan yeah. like caravan gangs within this hive makes so much sense. Not just almost like, like, uh, like pulling rickshaws with yeah. their equipment and Yeah, yeah. Oh. It, it it lends itself to so much more depth than just my my gang is fighting your gang. You know, yeah. it, it's it's not just and it, you know capturing territory. Yeah, you can capture territory, but unless you leave the right amount of guards behind or so forth, that territory is going to go because how you are you going to hold it? How are you going to hold it? Exactly. Like unless you've got automated turrets, but even then, if there's enough zombies, they'll overpopulate the place. You know what I mean? And how is that? How is that settlement going to survive? Sorry, how is that territory going to survive unless you've got people there? And how are those people who are supposed to be getting the territory to function supposed to do their job without having yep. bodyguards? So suddenly, yep. your gang is not just your fifteen models or your ten models or whatever they are. You're talking about having an infrastructure that lies behind every battle that you're fighting. And that's because of the emptiness of Hive Mortis. I've just got this image of my Goliath Forge boss for my Dead Boy's Army. Yeah. Um, Dead Boy's Army for my uh, uh, Dead Boy gang, where yeah. he would have almost like this uh, backpack with this long pole coming at the back of it, and there'd be a quote unquote live zombie strapped to it, but with no arms or legs. Almost yeah. like a I I defeated this and I I take it everywhere with me. Almost yeah. like a you know, because these like you've said it, they've gone native. Yeah. And these new gangs come into Mortis and they're like, oh, you know, we're we were pretty big in Primus or we're you know, we're pretty important over in the needle or mate, we've been to Secundus. We're not scared of anything here. Until you see this like eight foot tall, iron armor plated Goliath with these two horrific great axes with a freaking plague zombie strapped to his back or to like a shield yeah, so yeah. he can try and slam the shield into you. Are you going to get bitten by this zombie? I love that. Yeah, he's, he's bashing you and giving you a zombie plague all at the same time. Yeah, like there's no rules for that, but that's awesome. Oh, like. Hey. As I said, if you're an arbiter, like when when you get thumped by this weapon, like you need to take a cool check. Take it's a just, cool check. It just it just terrifies it's, you. There must be an item. Yeah. There must be an <laughs> item that does that. Just make just make it a. Uh, uh, what did we say that? Um, make it a. What were the rings that had the lasers in them? Oh, the, the uh, digi lasers. But digi like lasers. The bolt gun laser. Digi laser. <laughs> Make it a digi laser, but it's actually just the zombie clawing at you. <laughs> yes. yes, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I, you know, I just thinking about it, I'd be terrified as a juve going, "Hey, this is where we're going." They're like, can't we, can't we just stay at home? You know, can't we just not go to Hive Mortis? But as you said, this this is where the people would be going to make their fame and fortune. Now, I yeah. just want to slip, uh, flip our train of thought just a little bit here because we, we've talked a lot about the, the nitty and the gritty and the darkness of Hive Mortis, but something that you mentioned earlier in our chat, um, the Spire, actually oh, getting man. up just, into the Spire. Yeah, we need to reverse because <laughs> this, is, this, is probably one of the cool, this. this is probably one of the coolest parts about Hive Mortis. Yeah. Um, no one's allowed into the Spire and... We've mentioned that the Escher are basically in charge at Hive Mortis. They're the most dominant clan house. And House Escher um, were given rules when they went in. And House Escher enforces these rules on behalf of the Imperial House. Now, they take the lion's share of creds for the Hive salvage and the corpses. But the spires of Mortis remain off limits to everyone. The remains of House Aranthus are still sealed up inside, and no one is allowed to get those remains. 
So other gangs are trying to get in there. Yeah, and right. House Escher are guarding the spire against all interlopers. Why do House Helmore not want people to find the remains of House Aranthus? It's just the remains that remain. Is there... Are they... I'm going to throw it out there. Are they still potentially... Is there still potentially live I members? Think, I, think they're, I think there are members still alive. Yeah. I truly believe that yeah. someone from House Aranthus is still alive in Hive Mortis. It, possibly not alive, possibly in maybe giant robot form, or oh, right. they yeah. are in some sort of cryostasis or mm. something. We don't know. Yeah. But yeah. I, I truly believe it will come out that someone from House Aranthus is in there and the Imperial House is not willing to let people know what's going on just yet. Yeah, right. So I, I'm I'm with you on that. And the idea that you say, oh, what is it? The House House Escher are, are defending the Spire and not allowing people to try and get their way into it is bullshit. They would be trying to get their way into it as well. They would be knocking on every door, defeating every tech that's that's trying to block them through there whilst on one hand, saying, yeah, 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 Helmore, we're not, we're not getting in there, Jesus. We're on your it, side. It's, it says, that, and you know, this is just what House Asher want us to believe. It yeah. says that not even the Death Maidens themselves know for sure what lies beyond the sealed gates of Mortis's wall. Um, I believe that. I believe they don't I, know. I believe they don't know. But given their um, hat-based influences in House Asher... They would certainly be a lot very, very curious because the curiosity killed the cat. <sighs> um, <laughs> it may not just be the cat that's going down here. <laughs> but yeah, as as I was saying, like the there are other gangs trying to get in, and one of the ones that we do know about who are active in actively trying to get in are the Delacroix. Mm-hmm. Correct pronunciation. And they, they, it makes sense. This would be un, un, unprotected secrets once they get in. You know, this is, this is the tasty treasure trove. This would reveal not only secrets about Aranthus, but also about Helmore as well. So all the things that Helmore would try, have tried to hide that Aranthus would be holding on to. That's what Delacroix would be going after. They'd be like, this is the good stuff. You know, we, we do get other secrets and we do get other bits of information, but that is all governed by the noble house. Whereas here, it's the raw stuff, the raw data, things that they would be terrified because Aranthus has them. Oh, it was, I believe, in the House of Shadows book. It talks about the Delark in Hive Mortis. And it's, it's very interesting that you say that they're trying to get to the truth and exactly all that sort of stuff there. Mm. Because it specifically says here, and I'll just bring this one up, um, while other clan houses fight for corpses and lost technology, the House of Shadows' interest in the Heim seems more to do with unravelling its secrets. Delark agents and gangs have made the Hive their home and pay well for expeditions into unexplored regions or the retrieval of data slates, pick captures, and Vox recordings from a time before the plague. They are also the ones working most diligently to defeat the ancient defences of the wall between the Hive City and Spire in order to reach the old stronghold of House Aranthus. In fact, the Delark have been amassing artefacts of the Lost House ever since the living returned to Hive Mortis, and certainly seem more interested than most in the plague and the reasons behind it that killed off the old noble house. Yeah, right. They're, they're, they're fishing. They're fishing they, for... They know something. Mm. Yeah, they're, they're fishing for some tasty little nugget of information, whether it be to confirm their suspicions or whether it's enough to destabilise the power in, let's not say Primus, but another hive or even potentially a Primus, who knows. Well, the end of that reading... I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but 
though some suspect the Delarc are after more than just Archaeotech and some lost noble treasure. And they would be right. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> That's... What are they doing? What, they, I reckon they know something's happened. They know oh. something's going on in the spire. Oh. And they're, they're trying to get it. They want what's going on in there. Yeah, oh, 100%. And it'd be interesting to see, the, the, obviously, Escher's the, the powerhouse there, but surely then Delacroix would be their principal opposition. They would be the ones that they're having to put the fires out on all the time because they, they would just be causing absolute havoc for them because they're attacking the hive not in a, a traditional way but in a very Delacroix style of information gathering, but they're going for the spire. Everybody else, as you said, is going for, you know, the corpses and what have you and what have you, the day-to-day. The Escher would be particularly on guard against the the Delacroix gangs that are going particularly for the the spire. Well, I love the fact it talks about there. They're just like, oh, yeah, we're um, happy to pay for data slates or pick captures or vox recordings of stuff from before the plague, whether it's security footage of, you know, a marketplace or, you know, old Timmy Aranthus, his <laughs> shopping list. And they want all this information because in my mind, they're trying to build a timeline. They want to know right. from when That's cool. the first person got infected yeah. to the hive gets shut down. What's happened yeah. between there? Yeah, like, you know, they they're um like you know CSI hive mortising this whole situation. <laughs> um, but what's the idea of like them coming through to try and actually gain the knowledge of the plague? So I'm assuming that that's a a lost bit of knowledge as well. So who and if they control a plague that devastating, then they control the ability to to threaten a hive. Really, they do control a hive. They can go, well, we can drop. The, the mortis plague on you anytime we feel like because we know how it was made we know what it can do and everybody knows what it can do yeah. but more important we can distribute it in your system before you even have a chance to leave this room but even if you ignore the possibility of uh you know familial genocide mm. just being able to turn around and be like oh so um Hey, Gerontius, your great-great-great-grandmother uh, killed 20 million people. And we it's always been rumoured that uh, your family did it, but here's the proof. And yeah, now right. we yeah. want this, or we tell everyone. Yeah, and or, how much would that destabilise House Helmore? Yeah. Yes. Yes, and that's where I think they're doing this on purpose to try and find what's happened because they, they know what's happened, but they've mm. got to be able to prove it. Yeah. And, yeah, that's where, that's where I think this is coming in. Yeah, 100%. And, and we'll probably end up, um, well, I'm hoping to, I'm hoping that we find out more information regarding Mortis in the Aranthian succession. Oh, man, I hope so. We have to. It's got so much about um, House Aranthus and obviously with the Aranthian succession. I would love for us to learn so much more about this. Hell, I'd love to just have it confirmed that, you know, Anna Helmore did this. Like, it's just rumoured at the moment. I'd love for us to just know, for it to be like, oh, yeah, Yeah. no, she she definitely did it, you know. She's a bitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she did it on purpose. She Why'd she like do her. it? Uh, because House Aranthus sold two more boxes of last gun <laughs> power cells than they did yeah. that month. Like, yeah. she killed twenty million people for two power cells. Yeah, imagine if they'd sold three more. You'd be like, yeah, oh, exactly. <laughs> It'd go million. the way of uh, the skull of High Arcos, absolutely oh. buried. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Well, uh, you've... And that's that's the the horrible thing with GW lore as well is that there's always that mystery. So we may never actually find out any of this truth, but for us, I don't think we will. No, I don't, I don't think we will. I'd love it. I'd love it in this third book if it comes out and they just go, "Yep, 
this is what happened. And it was it was over a couple of boxes of the last gun power cells and have at them. That now yeah. we sort of should probably wrap up our our hour long chat about um how oh, sorry about her. I just, I'm not, it just feels like it, um, about Hive Mortis. But the last thing there is, that I wanted to mention is how law enforcement would work in the Hive, I think is a very important factor. You oh, know, in, in a current Hive Mortis? Yeah, in a current Hive Mortis. Mm. Oh, man. Because um, remember the yeah. Nomadic, yeah? The, yeah? A lot of the gangs, well, the... they'd be shifting a lot of these gangs. Um, and there'd be a lot more open spaces. So it's not like you know this particular Orlock or yeah. Delacroix or Quartal gang are always here. They they could be here for one season and then, you know, 100, 100 kilometres away in another part. So, yeah. Um, hey, look, I mean, they, we don't have to venture too far into it, but it's an interesting I, thing. You ever see the movie Tombstone? Yes. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, honestly, one of my absolute favourite movies of all time. Mm. Um, they were all criminals. All mm. of them. Yeah. Wyatt Earp, Dark Hall, every single one of them. Yeah. Criminals. Enforcers, we know, are criminals. Yeah. I picture the enforcers or local militias or deputies or whatever it is living in Hive Mortis. I see them as criminals with badge. I see yeah, them yeah, as right. not necessarily bad guys, mm. um, but these are the rules of my town, and if you break the rules, there is one punishment, and yeah. it's death. And it may be something as simple as, you know, against the wall and we shoot you. It may be, depending on, you know, how bad they are as people, they may throw you in a pit where they've got a couple of plague zombies. Yeah, um, right. yeah. But it, I also think it would be real frontier justice where Righto. it's yep. almost um, we, we sort of say to gangs or we say to people who live within the settlement, we mm. want you to be law and order. Um, now... That being said, I think you would have those travelling band, those nomadic bands of enforcers mm. going from settlement to settlement and enforcing Palmore's law and order, mm. Yep. Um, which gives you some really cool modelling options there. Mm. Uh, me yep. personally, I would do them as bad zone enforcers. So you've got like the deputised hive scum and yeah, sort right. of less real structure. Yeah. Um, but, I'm thinking Magnificent Seven sort of thing. Oh, man. Just seven enforcers, and they're all just like, yeah. you know, each one's got their own little unique weapon that they use, and they're all just like, you know, uh, very individual in the way, not only the way they look, but the way they fight as well. That'd be very cool. Well, it'd be amazing because you'd build them up, each of them up as a real veteran. Um, mm. You know, yep. mismatched right. armour. You know, you've got the... You've got the Goliath turned enforcer where he's got his his enforcer, you know, carapace or whatever, but he's still got those big Goliath shoulder pads or yep. uh, you've got an enforcer carrying a Goliath axe and a shield. Real like um D D Paladin style yeah. or D D cool. maybe D D Barbarian getting in there up close and personal with this suppression shield and power axe, you know, like yeah. Yeah. Um, that's how I picture the sort of law and order of just real desperados with a job. Yeah, so sort of being um, given like a writ of justice to go yeah. off. and, oh, and you, A writ you know, of justice, that's an amazing concept. <laughs> so they're like, you need to, like we, we uh, as a Palanites, we will come around and we will enforce the rule of Helmore. But yes. on a day-to-day, -day, we, we're not going to establish ourselves here. It's... You know, one, who wants to be there? Two, it's too dangerous. And three, you people know it better than we do. Yes. Yeah. That's oh. cool. All right. You've, you've, you've sated my, my desire for knowledge about what I think well, justice and... Like 114% uh, of the stuff I've said this episode is just from my brain. Um, 
<laughs> whether it's whether it's real, whether it's even plausible, Games Workshop got going to release another book for the Aranthian Succession eventually, and it's just going to be like, oh yeah, so uh, and it's going to be written in there. They've ju- they've just known it straight away. It's like all that crap Spamuel went on in this particular yeah. episode. Wrong. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Here's a Spamuel like, correction for you. All yeah. wrong. Yeah. Um, you know, and and everyone's just going to be like, well, correct oh. that one, idiot. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, like, the entire episode's an apology. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's that's just that's just what I want Mortis to be. You know, we've mm. taken a lot of this stuff from some of the House of Books and the the rule book and some of the background there. Uh, but especially because, and this just shows you about Games Workshop writers, where when they're building these these almost you know we think of them as throwaway lines and then like five books later it's oh remember that three word line you read oh here's an entire campaign about it yeah. like boom yeah. um these things come out and you're just like this is amazing mm. they've just they've done such a good job just with everything so far and mm. now going through the succession and that we're talking about mortis we're talking about house of aranthus and I'm I'm aching for more. I'm aching mm. for more. Not not just how they're answered, mm. not just the campaign. Just more of these little snippets of information about stuff that we only know like ten percent of. Just give me another ten percent. Yeah, give me another, or give, even, me, give me give me five percent. I'll I'll, 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 I'll settle it. with five. Yeah, I will yeah. take that because I just want to know a little bit more about. Like, I would love to know more about how the individual houses operate within Mortis and yeah. Not not just the gangs, but how the houses themselves operate. You know, what's their end game? Because it, we know the Delacroix end game. We know the Escher in charge. But the other houses, what what are they doing? Like, what's what's House Quarter doing in there? You know what I mean? Like, surely this is an affront to their belief system. Yeah, well, so- oh, man, like we know there are going to be Quarter there. Wherever there's rubbish, there's Quarter. <laughs> um, and. They'd be the, who who's picking through the pockets of these corpses before they're collected by the guilders mm. or the slave True. trains and like yeah. Garrett like you can imagine the oh man here's an idea for a corridor hive mortal skank um yeah. literally as the position within corridor have them as bone pickers where That's all cool. their their weapons are made from um the bones and they um, have like that picture, this standard, remember my Goliath before with the zombie strapped to the front of it? Yeah. Um, where like this go- this Cordor gang leader got bitten mm. and he turned into a zombie, but he's their prophet. So they're car- yeah. or they're carrying him around in like a palanquin. And yeah, yeah, yeah. he's just gibbering and rah, 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 rah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've got, you've got like these guys standing next to him like this leader, this zombie leader is an oracle. And they're like, mm, no, we have to go three days east yeah. into the next hab zone. And yeah. we, we need to travel. We need to bring the word of the god emperor. And, you know, they're going through. And it just happens. They just keep lucking out and finding like they, – they, they find – uh, an ecclesiarchy shrine, and they're like, "See, this is this is what he told us to come, and we yeah. have to build this into our new little settlement." And you've got yeah. this thing where these people are coming to worship this zombie, and you're just like, "Yeah, you guys know he's just he's a zombie, right?" Yeah, and they're like, like "No, no, no, yeah, he's no, a prophet. Is, he's, yeah. a, he's a prophet of the God Emperor." Duh. Yeah, <laughs> and. Oh man, that's an awesome idea for a campaign. I think that's a freaking awesome idea. I love that. Right. Trying to take yeah. down like, um, you know, oh, what can I? What would I call it? Don't call it Timmy Town. Um, what would I call it? Um, Timville. Timville. Uh, <laughs> no, you call it like a prophet's retreat or something ridiculous yeah. like that. And everyone's like, "Oh, what's in prophet's retreat?" Where it's this corridor gang that are gathering these zombies mm. and. They're keeping them in these cages as sort of like um, building a church for their leader. Who's oh, and right. you know at the end the, the final hmm. game would be you've, you've got to kill the leader because that's what you've been sent in to do. Because once yeah, he's right. dead, the corridor will dissipate. Um, but to get to him, you've got to get through the corridor gang and the zombies. The zombies are taking the corridor, and the corridor yeah. are then turning into zombies. 
and yes. you can only kill them by sculling them. You can't just flesh wound or serious yeah. wound them. They got to yeah. be sculled. Yeah, and... you got to drop them proper. Yeah. Oh man, such a cool idea. What are you doing this weekend? <laughs> <laughs> Making zombies, apparently. Making zombies. Um, no, no, no. Building an admech. Yes. Admech yes. Van Sy um, game. <laughs> I'm building my mortar squat. No, my no, you're not. Squat, squats. I'm yeah. building my squats. Squatties. Yeah. No, I'm painting my squats. They're, they're yeah. freaking built. Yeah. Paint them. One um, layer of paint. One layer of paint. I need three <laughs> colors. Three colors and base. Yeah. Uh, there are three shades of black on that, sir. Um, <laughs> okay, so that has been hive mortis. And I think I think we've covered it quite nicely. Um, I, f- I feel more enlightened about hive mortars. Um, I certainly don't have any uh, desire to participate. I never want to go there. Yeah, <laughs> just it sounds dreadful. It sounds I'm absolutely... scared that I'm going to um, be playing a game based on hive mortars with you, and I'm going to go to pick up one of the miniatures, and it's going to like puncture my finger, and I'm <laughs> going like... to turn into a zombie. <laughs> yeah, um, like that's it. I'm done. A good excuse not to paint miniatures, though. Mm. Mm. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah the, so the, the next, uh, I guess we move on to our, our next topic for this, for this episode. And as we said before, the second hive we're discussing, strangely enough, is not Secundus. We're actually talking about Gothril's Needle. Uh, and... It's a hive with a little bit of a darker secret than Secundus. Why don't you take us away with that one, Nate? Sure. Hive Primus holds a monopoly on off-world trade and is Necromunda's gateway to the stars. Its keys held tightly in the hands of Lord Garantius Helmore. It was not always so. However, Gothel's needle, its spies ri- rivaling the height of Hive Primus, was one of Necromunda's first spaceports, and its upper levels are still festooned with docking platforms and terminus stations for orbital craft. Yet it was not just because of its place as a trade rival to High Primus and the ascendancy of the Palatine Cluster that Gothril's fortunes were seized upon. Gothril's needle is ruled by the most dangerous and pernicious. Pernicious. Pernicious? Is that a word? It's written down. I think it's a word. (laughs) (laughs) And pernicious of governmental forms. Democracy. Yeah, the scary word, the D word. A council of elective representatives control the interests of the hive city and regulate the activities of the great houses, ensuring ensuring the fair treatment of its citizens and safety for all. Considered as insidious as any Xenos threat or chaos cult in fact, infestation, the great houses of the other hives have tried for many Terran years to bring down the rulers of Gothral. When cutting them off from the from orbital trade did not diminish their wealth and power, the great houses then began, began a long shadow war. Gangs and gang warfare are prohibited by, Gothel, by the Gothral Council, and the clan houses are only tolerated to exist upon the proviso that they keep their populations in check. Even so, criminal elements run rife in the lower levels of the Hive, and Gothel citizen protection officers, the Hive City's volunteer enforcer cadres, are constantly tested. House Delacroix is a principal player in the destabilization of Gothel's needle. It's subservient to gangs routinely committing acts of sabotage and murder. From the sump choked depths of the Hive, Cinch Guvros, the most powerful of Delacroix, overlords wages his war of terror his gang has raid the upper levels attacking hab parks and exchange pl- exchange plazas each one a blow against the against the gothel council okay that that is a lot now where do we start here because i know the exact line i want to pounce on here and that is gothel's citizen protection officers yeah, right. The Hive's yeah. volunteer enforcer cadres. So instead of being, like, press-ganged, brainwashed, and turned into, like, 
R bikes wannabes, or as they are uh, lovingly known, Arbos here in Australia. Um, <laughs> I promised someone I would start calling them all Arbos, and I'm down with it. Um, I've never heard that before, and I think it's great. Arbos. Arbos. Oh, no, Arbos. Bloody Arbos. Bloody Arbos are here, mate. Oh, just get here. Get here. But volunteer enforcer card race. Like, imagine being so bored with your day-to-day life. You're like, I want to get shot at by the lark for the rest of my life. I, I I love that as a concept. Like of all the stuff about the insanity that is Gothrill's needle, needle, a uh, hive being led by democracy, mm. by a council that has banned gang warfare. Yeah, uh, <laughs> for them to just be like, all of our police are going to be just people who volunteer. That's the most insane part of this to me. It's- Okay, so you read that as volunteer, unpaid volunteer. I read that as oh, like no. I'm signing up to the, the I'm signing Arbo up to be a police officer. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah I'm okay. I'm just signing up instead of being picked as, you know, that this guy knows how to take care of himself. This this gal can obviously handle herself in a fight. We're gonna grab yeah. them, we're gonna turn them into enforcers. Um yeah. it's no, these these people are choosing to be cops. Um yeah. In a yeah, place absolutely. Like this. Yeah, and and knowing that the predominant enemy they fight against is Delacroix, so people who are going to know everything about their comings and goings, their ins and outs, their connections. And I'll just put a little caveat to our discussion about Gothel's needle. We I did mention it before when we talk about mortars. We do need to make some points, but the caveat I'm attaching to this is that it is pronounced Delacroix. And if you do not like that pronunciation, <laughs> then I, I beg for your forgiveness. But also, I'm going to say Delacroix a lot. So <laughs> uh, you really, you really are. Yeah. Um, so okay. No, so, so my 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 point about them is that you have this this force that's obviously, you know, for use of a better term, like a, a modern day sort of police force, like in a in a real world sense, where you have people who are going. I want to do the right thing by my community, by my, by my sector, I guess. And I dare I say it, they, they are doing it for the greater good. Yeah, and I, I see where that's coming from. But, man, to me, especially when you've got such a heavy Delac presence there, um, how many of them are volunteering and you know, being put into positions where they are the cops. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's that's where I think, um, and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about um, Hive Mortis, when, you were, when we were talking about vetting your mm. sort of immigrants into your settlements and stuff. Um, mm. How are they vetting these volunteers? Is it a, yeah. you know, like the PDF where you got to just, you know, get through a minimum physical requirement, minimal mental requirement to get in to get the job um but that's very true it's it's interesting it's an interesting question because yeah i mean other than having a shaved head and quite a scrawny body um you're not really going to be able to distinguish a Delacroix member from a regular member of the citizenry so how how would they be trying to well maybe maybe their police forces would be something that's more um, more historical based, you know what I mean? So my my father's father was a was a copper, and you know my uncle's a copper, and we we all actually know each other. Do you know what I mean? So that's how yeah. their police force are brought together. Is it? It's more of a, you know, I guess you could say take a thousand or ten thousand families, and those ten thousand families are the families that generally genuinely provide. The, the police force for that section or that region of Gothel's Needle. And so you, there's a family link. Oh, oh, oh. So you're almost Im- implying that there could be like a police clan. Yes. It's, it's yeah. almost a story. Okay. Cause... I'm try- I'm, I'm the, I've lost the word. I can't, it slipped out of my head. I can't think of it. But it's it's um, it's not nepotism, but it's it's sort of like it becomes – like your family's tradition. To, your, to your, hereditary, your hereditary hereditary dynasty is your police officer. Exactly. Yeah, because exactly. 
I think of this and I'm thinking, because um, it talks earlier, they cut them off from orbital trade um, oh. and they've begun this shadow war. In my mind, and oh, so going to tabletop here, how I would model these volunteer citizen mm. protection officers is basically damn near identical to the Games Workshop bad zone enforcers where your your juves coming in, your fresh recruits are going to be basically hive scum in Ooh. leather armor, you know, just their regular clothing, but they've got a badge. And then as you're actually getting higher up in the ranks and that there, you'd start getting actual enforcer armor and uh, you'd be yeah, starting right. to look more and more like a police officer. Um, but I've I've got a slightly different view. Really? I, I, yeah, I see it like if if we think of them as something that they they the the institution of them needs to be protected because they can't be infiltrated by the Delacroix. They can't be infiltrated by even other gangs, right? They they need to maintain this police force that is is effectively fighting for the citizenry of um, Gothel's Needle. So they would almost have like heirloom pieces that would get passed on, you know, so you would have mm-hmm. these these weapons and these bits of armour and so forth that would actually get passed on down the line. And so you'd have some really old, old tech. Um, you'd even have some, you know, newer stuff that they, yeah, as, to me, as they move up the ranks, they're able to get it manufactured or so forth. But they would start off with, like, you know, things that, oh, this is my grandfather's 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 shotgun and it's still in use today. And that just shows that their lineage, that's the word I was looking for, their lineage is hasn't been corrupted by an external presence looking to undermine the democracy that I have. Yeah, I like that. It's very Vostroyan. Very ex- Vostroyan. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I didn't want to mention them, but <laughs> it, it is it is Vostroyan in a sense. So you have this this police force that is, you know, you, I guess if you were to play them, if you were to run them, corruption is the one thing you'd be looking to root out the entire time. You know, everybody's trying to get their one-upmanship in in Necromunda. Everybody's just trying to get their little tiny crumb of the pie. But in this, and again, I, I, I say it, but I don't believe in it, is there is a greater good. You know, this this police, this citizen police force would be looking at their role as a format of the greater good. Like, we, you know, we're not just fighting just to establish power for ourselves. We're actually fighting to ensure that our hive remains as it was and as it should be. Well, we need to talk about the hive. Mm. Um, and Gothril is a strange place, especially when you make the comparison between literally anywhere else on Necromunda. Um, and in my mind, probably literally any other hive world where yeah it's it's a democracy people are voting and the the council of elected representatives control the the interests of the hive city and regulate the activities of the great houses ensuring and this part blows my mind the fair treatment of its citizens and safety for all yeah can you imagine telling a great house to do anything? <laughs> True. Well, well, yeah, telling the imperial house this is the way it's going to be because your production quotas are important, but we're not going to lose our citizens over it. And don't get me wrong, I understand democracy exists on plenty of places in the 41st millennium. Uh, we know that planetary governors are quite specifically given the edict of as, you know, showing the amazing ties back to capitalism. Um, as long as you're paying what you need to pay, no one cares. doesn't matter how you run your planet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Praise the God Emperor, pass the ammunition, do as you're told. Apart from that, you do what you want. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, 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 that would imply that Gothel's Needle is still maintaining its, um, its imperial tithe, still absolutely. maintaining its quota. So if that be the case, then it shows that the, the brutality that exists in the other hives about the you know the, the crushing of the human spirit to ensure the tithe is met is is only a, a method of maintaining that tithe 
So it shows that it can still be maintained whilst also ensuring that the citizenship, citizenry is also looked after as well. Well, I think so much of it just comes down to the end justifies the means. If you need to brutalise the citizens of your hive to get what we need from you tithe-wise, you do you. Um, if you need to run it as a democracy, if you need to run it as a, I don't know, a communistic, militaristic dynasty, whatever. Um, yep. but, but I think the problem that is had here is by the imperial house, the great houses, and the clan houses themselves, because the power has been taken away from the few, and weirdly yeah. enough, somehow given to the many. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. And uh, we mentioned that in the the Escher episode, where we talk about how they they're reliant for their production; they're reliant on keeping their yeah. citizens on board. You know, and so if they... it was actually pointed out to me that. That that's real. Pe peasants in the like feudal ages routinely did that. Um, man, I'd love to remember who actually told me that, but apparently it was basically if you weren't looking after your citizenry, the ones who were in charge of your farms, who were responsible for making you your taxes to pay your lord his due taxes, mm -hmm. to pay your king his due taxes, the citizens just left. They just go to the neighbouring. Duchy, duchy, village, duchy? village. They just go next door and be like, yeah. "We live here now. We work on these farms now." Yeah, because you'll you'll actually maintain something that looks like a proper livelihood for us. So when we went, I I love Gothel's Needle. I think it's, and I think I mentioned it earlier in the episode that this and Secundus are my two favourites. There's just so much going on. But when we're talking about the houses and the, the governance, the question needs to be asked about what exactly is the ruling council, who's made up of them, how do they look, um, and surely the the houses that are, or the rulers that are in place aren't coming from the, the houses that are, or the noble houses that are already in place, because their influence would be governed by uh, what Helmore would want them to do. So consequently, that wouldn't lead to the, the outcomes of Gothel's, Gothel's Needles looking for. Well, I don't see it that way. I, I look at it going, well, we, it's a democracy, and the council is made up of elected representatives. So much like I envision um, like a Senate or a Parliament and different, um, let's say, different domes or different hab zones would be able to elect their representative to the council. And obviously, um, you know, Dome 743, who produce, you know, a glorious amount of mushroom paste, aren't really going to be as powerful as uh, Dome 611, who produce uh, plasma cartridges, you know? So the that 611 uh, representative is going to have a little bit more sway, maybe sit on a different circle of the council they may be a little bit more forward um so, but... you, so you imagine this council is quite large then so you is that where your brain's thinking about yeah it? Abso absolutely okay. I, I i envision that there would be multi it'd be just like um, our parliament here you'd have each area would have their representative who would be in, on a state basis and then the states would mm. have their their representative sit on a national basis mm. um but we know we know it's elected, and I'm unsure um, what you would imagine the sort of interaction with the imperial house would be. Mm. Absolutely, they would still be in charge. They would be able to say, if push really came to shove, Gothril, cut the shit. It's like, this is how it needs to be. Yes, you can all vote for how you're going to do things, but at the end of the day, you owe us men, you owe us product, you owe us food, whatever it is their particular tithe is, whatever their particular oh. donation towards the planetary coffers are. Um, we don't care how you do it. You have to do this. But I think 
and sorry to cut you off, huh? I, th I think that if they were to do that, if the Imperial House was to flex its muscle, that would just lead to a civil war with, with Gothel's yeah, Needle. Gothel's yeah. Needle really hasn't uh, done too well when it comes to civil wars. I mean, <laughs> uh, I <know>. uh, <laughs> our, our gal Lady Cinderac kind yeah. of uh, yeah. turned around and said, hey, uh, I'm just going to remove all of your access to space. And yeah. it even mentions in that little read you did um, yeah. where it's still got all of the uh, the docking platforms and terminus yeah. stations. Um, they're not allowed to use them, remember? Yeah, but we, we, we have mentioned, and it was in episode one, no, episode two, where there is still craft that try to get to Gothel's Needle to dock there. And they get shot down and <laughs> wind up in Elmore's graveyard. I, I know, but there, there's still attempts made to get there. And I, look, I know, yeah, they don't go well in a civil war. And I guess the 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 concept must be that a civil war is more detrimental to Necromunda, even if it's just one hive versus everybody else. I mean, you, you'd imagine they'd get stomped out without much of a showing. Yeah. Um, but if it's if it's going to slow down production, or is if there's a particularly specialized bit of equipment or tech that's being produced from Gothel's Needle, and going well, if we go stomp out the hive, we could potentially lose that, which means that we lose that against our tithe requirement. Well, it's interesting that you mention tech, um, because sort of taking us uh, sort of a left field of what we're talking about here. Um, one of the clan house enclaves inside Gothel's Needle, is, one of the major enclaves is the Goliaths. And there's a really cool little bit of sort of lore about them in House of Chains. And it is, uh, let me just bring this one here. So despite being largely isolated from the rest of the planet's hives by distance and the ancient laws of House Helmore, the subjects of Gothral's Needle enjoy a standard of living unique on Necromunda, where education and automation have failed or vanished in other places. They thrive in Gothral's Needle under its Democratic Citizens Council. That the people probably enjoy fewer freedoms than their equivalents in Hive Primus or other places, most accept the rules of the Council for the good of all. The Goliaths are no exception. And their enclave, the Titan Works, is wholly committed to the continuance of the Council and their programs for the betterment of all. This loyalty has been rewarded by Gothral's leader, granting the Goliaths advanced technologies and excellent Medicaid care. Perfect specimens of their race, the people of the Titan Works stand taller and prouder than many other Goliaths displaying their forms not with crude armour and intimidating mohawks, but with gleaming bald heads and immaculate forge suits, bearing the giant human silhouette of the Titan Works. All is not well in Gothral's Needle, however, and the gangs of the Titan Works must fight constant battles against Dalark interlopers, the shadowy clan house waging a war on behalf of Lord Helmore to bring down the Council, a war the Goliaths are determined to win. That is so cool. You, it is, it is something that we know. I'm not going to say no and love. Something that we know the Goliaths, and looking at them in a completely different way, and just the having these like, I don't know, pseudo space marines almost. You know, these yes. giant yes. things, this like in in beautiful armor, not just ramshackle clumped together things. But I'm like, so glad you said it, not me. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about space marines again. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. But, but <laughs> yes, that's exactly how I view them. Yeah. By reading yeah. that, that's why I see it as well. It's, it, so they're, the clan houses, so the ruling body is obviously seeing that the, the betterment of House Goliath through more education and actually better genetic sinking. But the betterment of everyone. That, that, that was my point. Yeah. Where <laughs> education and automation have failed or vanished in other places, mm. they thrive in Gothral's Needle under its Democratic Citizens Council. Because right. Right. instead of, um, you know, Timmy Helmore saying, um, well, hey, we've got all this money, 
and we've got a bunch of starving, you know, lessers. Um, I probably need new solid gold bed sheets, don't you think? Whereas the citizen council, they've been elected on healthcare and food and mm, education oh. and that sort of thing. And they're doing this weird thing where they're actually doing what they've promised and <laughs> where it's education and automation. So can, can you imagine hive scum going to school? Can you imagine <laughs> genuine hive citizenry going to school and getting an education? And then it's just like, oh, BT dubs. Um, you don't need to worry about slapping together those auto guns in the factory today. We've got machines that do it for us. Like, that's how yeah. I see it. And mm. it even says people probably enjoy fewer freedoms than their equivalents yep. in Hive Primus. But they're cool with it because they understand that the rules are there for the betterment of everyone. And yep. um, you should obey your government's people. No matter what they say, <laughs> no matter what they do, uh, obey your governments. Um, Are you trying to get the the podcast promoted in certain? Yeah, Asian we're countries? actually we're actually getting well, paid. We're actually getting played in Parliament this weekend. <laughs> um, but it's insane because, like the Goliaths, they the this concept of them being. Better. They are perfect specimens of their race. Mm. And it's because, and this whole sort of sidetrack has come from what you said there. Maybe they have technology and that sort of thing. Yeah, they have technology given the, to them by the democratically elected council of Gothral's Needle. And yeah. they've literally, they're saying to them, hey, we will we'll make sure your cloning is a little bit better. We'll make sure that you're getting the right chems you're getting the right nutrients and i i genuinely think because we know the goliath are effectively a separate ab human race by this point yeah um gothril's needle may have perfected the goliath race and these men and women of the titan works with their gleaming bald heads in immaculate forge suits may be like the new man that someone like Fabius Bile is truly envisioning. And That's cool. it, it wasn't it wasn't done with Eldritch sorcery. Mm. It's yeah, it's advanced technology and the like, but it's been voted for. Yeah, it's been voted for. And it, it's taken time and they've invested that time and they've poured it into it. And you have this this proto um well, again I'm gonna say it, this proto space ring. You know, what you, you, you're starting to get this thing, and I can imagine the council going, "Well, okay, let's pick our strongest and our toughest and our biggest. That's going to be our Goliath. Let's make them a truly imposing force, but then is also completely bought into the idea of what Gothel's Needle's about. And so they're defending this to the death. They're just like, "Yes, we are. We're perfect specimens. We're going to defend this to the death." And they have the full back in the council, but the council knows that they need these as well. They can't. Mm. They th- this is the the ideal soldier to have for them. So, you know, they would pro- potentially grow their numbers and and drive them larger and larger. But because there's no, I guess, selfish gain for Goliath in here by going well, we'll become the most prominent and and dominant gang in this hive. They're like, no, we're we're fighting for the the betterment of this hive. Yeah. So their power is still centralized to that council, and they become they become like the, I guess, the fighting arm, you know, of of the 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 needle. Well, it's not even that. It's it's still like I one hundred percent agree with you. One hundred percent, everything you've said is correct. Mm. And yeah, you know what they're doing? It they're they're being selfish. I get it. They are, mm. but you know the end seems to justify the means here. Yeah, Mm. we're going to defend this council because they're making us the best of the best of the best when it comes to Goliath. But And the the flip side for the council is they're going, we now have the best of the best of the best of the the Goliaths. (laughs) So at the end of the day, it's a a, a, a win-win situation. It is win-win. And running it through my head, there's not another gang that you could get the best out of for that. You know, obviously Delacroix. 
checked off the list because they're obviously in a in an active war with the hive. Um, yeah, they're, but... they're they're trying to take down the council, and so, it seems that the Dalak and Gothel's Needle are at war with everyone. Yeah, exactly. But then if you go look through who who else would this council pick? Which other house, mm. clan house, would they pick? You're not picking Esher. Esher are just like for as much as I love them, they're far too self focused on their own gains of power. Oh, you know, they, yeah. they want to see how they they're encountered. Cordor, mate, too but too bonkers to to allow that much uh, freedom and power. If the go. emperor wanted me to vote, he would have made me live in a voting booth. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and then you have what was the other games that were advanced art, just far too weak and useless. Uh, <laughs> ironic. Um, <laughs> um, and then, but they're, again, they're 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 out there. They don't advance art for me, and we probably will go into them at some stage. You probably know more. But when I view them, I look at them as a gang. That is purely there for their own devices, and their power is yes. derived by their technology. Whereas Escher wants power in this grand global scale, um, they want power in it in a slightly different way, and it's in, in a less linear way. So when you go through all the, and I, I think I've mentioned all of them. There's a core. Well, I, the, the, it doesn't make sense for the Orlock to be mm. fighting mm. for the council because the Orlock themselves came from revolution. Um, yeah. and they maintain go. a huge population of, you know, prisoners with jobs. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the drudging class of House Orlock. Yeah, it's where their gangs come from, but mm. you only you only get out of that class when you show that you're going to fight the system, not mm. not help a system where everyone's voice is equal. Yeah, yeah. And so that that equality wouldn't sit well with with Orlock, I imagine. No, not at all. Uh, yeah, um, right. And this is why Goliath is the principal choice for them. So, it, as much as it's you know, it it's it's a beneficial for both. The House Council would be the Council. Sorry, not the House Council. The Council would be looking at that, going, the these we need to make them the strongest, the biggest, the best, equipped to the best equipment, so that if somebody does come knocking on our door, you know in a very direct and, um, I guess, focused attack on the hive, we potentially got thousands of these proto-abhumans, you know? Oh, and, yeah, and the rest. I can imagine that mm. given the advanced technology and mm. the reputation that the Titan Works would have, um, mm. I, I truly believe Goliath from across the planet would be going there because... Mm. You know, they all want to be bigger. They all want to be badder. They all want to be, you know, the mm. the bruisiest bruiser in the hive. Would, would they understand though what the Goliath of House oh, of of Gothel's Needle would be like? Would they yes. be able to grasp that? You reckon? Yes, they would. Oh, they, yeah, okay. I, I truly believe they would be like, well, uh, if one of the Titan works winds up in Primus. People may take a second to realise it's a Goliath because it's not in the that crude armour. It doesn't have the mohawk. It doesn't. Mm. It, it, they may be quite articulate as well. We don't. We don't yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but when it when it beats, you know, an ogre into death with its fists, and goes, yeah. "All right, I'm the biggest, baddest Goliath in the hive." People are going to know it's a Goliath. Because he says I'm the biggest baddest. Goliath. Yeah, and then yeah. other Goliath are going to go. Well, I'm gonna follow that guy, and right. go right. back to the needle and be like, "All right, cool. How do I become one of the Titan Works?" That's that's how I see it. Right, and you, you're touching on something here that I want to talk about, and remind me to come back to talking about what freedom looks like within this hive because I think that's a very interesting point. Um, but. You're talking about people coming to Gothel's Needle, right? Yeah. And this is something that I mentioned about uh, how, um, Hive Mortis as well. There would be a vetting program in place for people coming into, into Gothel's Needle because if you're getting every Tom, Dick and Harry rock up, then you're opening the door 
to people who want to undermine this democracy. Yep. You know? So you surely there would be something in place that would allow the the citizen enforcers to go, okay, we're we're not going to accept people from this particular hive, or we're not going to accept people on these particular levels of our hive. Well, I um, believe purely because of its location. Um, you remember Gothril's Needle is on like the other side of the planet to mm. Primus, to all of that sort of stuff. Um, the, the, I believe they were the two most furthest points from each other on Necromunda, being Primus and the Needle. Yep. Um, but you're obviously still going to have um, the ability to transfer, be it via um, highways or uh, maybe if some of the tramways and transport tubes and that are still operational. Um, but you mentioned in that reading um, criminal elements running rife in the lower levels of the hive. Oh. Um, that's where I think a lot of people are going to be going to because we've got to remember immigration from the lower hive into the upper hive and then into the spires. Oh. You can't just do that. You need to be able to prove that you, you know, you have the correct papers, you have the passport, you have the right stamps and visas. Yeah, um, okay. Your average person can't get up there where yeah. if you're, you know, you're from um, a, a particular noble family from one hive and you're going to another hive, you've, you've got the name, you've got the coin. Um, mm. You can possibly get there. You're visiting cousin you're, uh, from the house of your auntie or whatever. Um, but... In my mind, you're still going to be in your place in society. You have a rung that you belong to, and you are still going to be there. Um, right. Okay. So you're saying that you're still going to have these elements that, that block you from moving further up the hive, and that's where the, that's where the power base is being protected further up the hive. On that lower level, as we mentioned, it's the, the enforcer cadres who are protecting it on a real sort of day-to-day -day basis, like guns in the street sort of thing, but further up the hive from a more ideological and political basis, that's where that power lives. And yes. that's, it's being protected differently, more through, I guess it's it's almost like a sense of isolation. You know, if we can keep, if we can keep the, the usurpers and the, the underminers at the lower levels, we can still maintain this hive in a democratic fashion. Yes. And right. yeah. I, that's the way I see it because, yeah, this ruling council may be in charge of the operation of the hive and they may keep the, um, the great houses in line. The great houses are still there. They mm. may keep the clan houses in line as, you know, the, the clan houses are tolerated the, as long as they, you know, keep their populations in check. Mm. But the clan houses are still there. At the end of the day, your mm. democracy is all well and good, and you got the Titan works to hide behind. But we still have guns. Yeah. We still have, as as the Dalak is doing there, we still have bombs. We can still kill you, and we can still ruin as much of your voting as we can. No matter how fancy the equipment the Vansar have built for you is, we can still we can steal votes. We can do lots of things. Um, so that's why I think. Yeah, pop populations are still going to be able to come in. Um, right. It's a hell of a trip to get to Gothel's Needle from anywhere, mm -hmm. but they can still get in. Yeah, right, cool. So, yeah, the, the idea that the comings and goings is, is, I guess what I want to talk about is that there's a certain level of freedom about being able to come into the hive. Yeah. But what that freedom looks like within the hive and um, something that I said I want to come reach back onto is so... Yeah, the freedom inside Mortis is, Hive Mortis, is that you can go wherever you want by the sound of it. You know, and you, you do have this freedom to move around, do whatever you want, however you want to go. Um, just avoid the zombies. Just avoid the zombies. Yeah, they're, they're, the, they're the, the people that impede your freedom. Whereas in Hive, uh, sorry, in Gothel's Needle, you, the, the, the freedom there is you have a certain amount of freedom. And it's not like the, this roaming freedom that you have in Mortis. It is this freedom that is is governed by the ruling council. 
and it's it's and, even yeah sorry go and, ahead and and the people around you yeah yeah the like, people around yeah. you who have bought into the idea of what Gotham Central is about yeah but to me that is it, it's more restrictive than um than an, another hive where you know they go okay well this this section of the hive is run by uh the orlock or the the corridor and so as provided that you're ticking the boxes for those guys do whatever you want you know what i mean yeah you're, they're they're the police force they're the governing body in that area um whereas here because there's an overarching umbrella government you end up having this this sense of rule that comes from the very top to the very well not exit actually in the underhive elements but down to the the upper hive areas where that freedom is is restricted by that council well it even talks about there when we talked about the uh Goliath read there everyone understands they have less freedoms to a certain degree in the needle than you do in other hives especially um you know primus and the the that whole cluster mm. but that's just because you know everything is somewhat more fair for everyone else it's it's mm. a slightly more even in that respect i think the freedoms maybe that they are missing out on is the freedom to be a dick <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. if you think about it in hive primus you you you've you've got um Escher Wild Runners uh taking over settlements and just being like, uh, if you want to use my tunnel, you have to give me money. So you give them money and I'm gonna shoot off your toe anyway. Um yeah, right. whereas the, you know, the they don't have the freedom to do that. Um yeah. <laughs> you know it's I I I genuinely think of all the hives we've talked about so far, all two of them. Yeah, I was I was, we've, talked about, we've talked about Primus a little bit. We've talked about Secundus <laughs> a little bit. Um, Arcos a little bit. Oh. Um, Gothril's Needle sounds like the best place to live so far. Mm. Almost because it's trying to be a society. Yeah, it's not just a, a, a mechanism for production. It's yeah. actually trying to be better than than anything else around it. It's yeah, the only sure. place so far, and I know this isn't true, so whoever ends up correcting me on this, um, I hate you. No, I don't hate you. Um, <laughs> it's the only place so far where they've actively talked about there being education for people. I was going to come back to this, yeah. yeah. I, I love this because we know clan houses teach their own and that, but oh. the citizens, the hive citizens yep. the population the scummers whatever it's never really mentioned there but mm. we've we've got information here that there is education we know secundus was a place uh, it was a very learned uh place oh. um before the infestation and the like um uh, but nowhere else has really had um education talked about and that's one thing i'm really liking about this so far uh when it comes to gothra well see that that to me implies, and there's a couple of things that revolve around the, the, the idea of education in, in a Hive City, but it implies that you then start, by having that education, you can then highlight and pick out the pe best people to do certain jobs within, within your Hive. You know it's I mean? almost like you're getting employment and getting your standing based on merit, not just who you are. Um, and not just being just being forearms and and a, and a torso that breathes, you know. What I mean, you, you, yeah. you you're not just part of a production line. You're actually like, well, this person's probably going to be better you utilised in this facility because they're showing a certain aptitude for X, Y, and Z, or for plasma generators, or for melter, or whatever. And they go, okay, well, let's use them here because we're going to get the best out of them, which sort of to me speaks that there's advancement for the, the citizens as well. It's not just you are stuck where you're yeah. stuck. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And that once again comes back into the elected council mm. where these these people are rising above, you know, their station in life mm. to become more. Um, just a quick they're... thing about the education though. Like I'm, I'm a big advocate for teaching history in classrooms. So 
answer me this, Samuel. Do they teach their little students about the Horus Heresy? Yes. Oh, no, yes. they don't. Yes, they do. They, no, they, no, ev- they every, don't. Everyone knows the arch traitor Horus rose against the Emperor um, uh, and was smited. He was smited by the smitey smiting one. Okay. So why did he turn against the Emperor? Was he just a naughty, no good, no good Yeah, guy? He, was just, he was just no good. He was, oh, he was, just, he was just a bad guy. So they don't dabble in the uh, ruinous powers. They don't tell them that. Uh... No, because that's how your planet gets exterminated. <laughs> um, yeah. You remember, like, all those instances of when you hear veterans coming back and they're like, yeah, man, we served with these really cool dudes called the Grey Knights. No, because they get mind wiped and then melted, Nathan. Um, is it, oh, no, we, I fought this. I, I, when I saw this dirt, and as you're saying, the dirt. Someone comes out of the shadows and shoots you in the head. Yeah. Um, no, they, I, they would be taught history. It would be very doctored. Um, but they would be taught that someone rose against the emperor and he was killed and all of his forces were destroyed and oh. the emperor is infallible and you must obey him. Now, what is Gresha, the empress? Yeah, but that, that leads into another thing as well. Then you would have the idea that they would have religious education because you would have the influence of the ecclesiarchy. Oh, of course. This. So then you're already indoctrinating, indoctrinating your, your like, let's just say citizens. I don't want to say children because I don't know how the education system would work there. But let's just say you're indoctrinating your citizens on that, um, the imperial cult from a very early age. So that would mean that somebody like a gang like House Cordor would already have a foot in with a lot of these um a lot of these citizens because they would just be playing on the fact yes the the imperial cult is real the ecclesiarchy is a proper functioning arm of the 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 imperium and what we are doing is expressing that will um Yes, yes, and no. This goes into yeah. I was it was it the Bolter episode we were talking <laughs> yeah. about uh, religion? Uh-huh. Um, yeah, this goes into some huge stuff. I there would definitely be religious education. Um, it would be very brief. It would be, you know, you, you praise the emperor. What are the five tenets of uh, the basic tenets of the, that the ecclesiarchy allows uh, for a religion to be counted as part of um, true worship? It's like the emperor was once a man and walked on earth. He's yeah. infallible. Um, I read these know, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I will find this because it's actually a great little list, um, mm. which sort of breeds out to why there are so many different forms of, um, you know, the imperial religion. Um, yeah. But, but it, it, this yeah, is that's, yeah. that's a whole different episode. I know. Yeah, it's a whole different. Yeah. And we will, uh, we will touch on it one day in the future about what religion looks like on Necromunda because yeah. you know, there's so many different branches. But just the, 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 the dabbling just in two small areas of, um, of education within the gamut of the 40K universe yeah. and Necromunda, we're already opening up a bit of a Pandora's box. You know, it's not, it's well, the not only, something... The only schools I can really think of are like the Scholar Progenium. Yeah, um, but they're, they're warfare schools. They're so warfare schools, linear. they're orphanages. Um, yeah, but you know, the... what I'm saying is that's, that's linear. It's, it's your, your role is to become a, a mechanism, yeah, a, a part of the, the, imper- uh, the Astra Militarum machine, you know. So education... Oh, where where yeah. do the Ministorum... Where are they educated? Um, ministerium, as in like the, the clerks and all that sort of stuff. Where do they get educated? Would they be educated on the job? My understanding is that they are. Like you, your, your, your. I remember reading a story years and years ago. Now, like, oh, mate, I reckon ten years ago now, um, where it was somebody who was working, and they were just going up to their little potato machine, and they would just plug into it. And they would just punch through these numbers and they would come off, but they were in the process of learning how to do their job. And it was going to take them like five, six years to be properly 
indoctrinated into their job and ticked off as like a competent worker. And then from there, they would then move on to the, the end of the story. They end up getting killed by an Eversaw assassin. And it's nice. how they introduce the Eversaw assassin into this story. He just basically bursts out and kills this person and a whole bunch of others trying to get to a target. Um, yeah, I remember, was it the um, the Last Chances novel uh, when they are on Armageddon? There's a Ministorum adept. Oh, he had the coolest name. Um, Erasmus yeah. Spooge. It Erasmus. wasn't Timmy, no. It wasn't <laughs> Timmy. I think his nickname was Timmy, though. Uh, it, yeah. Was, yeah, it, it was Erasmus Spooge. And I remember he had this servo skull, and it was his father. And oh, cool. because yeah, when his father cool. passed, he took his father's role. Um, yep. And yep. in my mind, it, he was always, um, he always sort of implied that he, because his father had the job, he had to take, it was going back to that hereditary sort of mm. um, linear process of employment. Mm. Um, but yep. uh, in my mind, it was like, yeah, dad knew I was going to get the job because that's what you do. You have to, you, you, you say your kid's going to get the job. So you get a little bit of a pay bump or you get extra rations or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yep. His dad would have been teaching him because you're going to have to, do this job. You're going to need to know this stuff. And that's mm. what, in my mind, where a lot of education in 40K um, comes from. It's your family teaching you. It's your, um, although in, uh, was it the, it was the Night Lords trilogy by Aaron Dembski Bowden, mm-hmm. um, uh, Talos, uh, and, oh, I want to say it was Mikushian, but I, oh, I can't remember. But they were going to a school. This is uh, Nostromo, uh, you know, right. pre heresy. Yes. They were going to a school. I remember together this bit. And they yeah. joined the gang. And they were just yeah. like, well, I don't go to school anymore. Yeah. Um, so, but that's a. And uh, look, uh, one, one, one more comment from me about it, and maybe one more for you, you, and then maybe one more for me about it. But education in the 40K universe, because it is the, the universe is built around the defending humanity against the greater threats that are out there. Um, and that's consequently that wobbles down into what Necromunda's about as well, is, you know, you're fighting for your little patch of dirt and you're ensuring that nobody else comes along and kicks it over. So education in the broader sense in that, it has to be about an end goal. It can't just be like, well, today we're going to learn about religion and then we're going to learn a bit about history and then we're going to learn about this and learn about that and all these different facets. It has to be about... We are lear- you are learning this set of knowledge to get you ready to do this particular role so mm. that you can achieve this outcome for your cadre of people, for your community. But as I mentioned earlier, if the, if the education in the broader sense is, is what I imagine it to be, where you, you are learning multiple different things and that's how you're able to garner the best people for particular roles within Gothel's Needle, then that opens up a whole... Pandora's box about exploratively thinking about things in a Warhammer 40,000 sense, which is not really there to go, hey, let's ask the questions of why and why not. Those questions there are reserved for inquisitors and not for the common citizenry. Mm. That's my piece. Yes. Yeah. No, I I think um, I I just think there's so much to talk about here. There is. There, there's a ridiculous amount. Um, but, yeah, we'll, we'll move away from it. It's just it's something that, as we've discussed in this, in this episode, has been growing into my head, and I'm just thinking, right, there, there, there's something to be said here because once you start to talk about giving – when you talk about giving 20, 30,000 people with a population of billions – uh, the ability to ask why and why not, that's fine. But if you're talking about education on a, on a vast scale within the presence of a hive and you're talking about millions, tens of millions of people being filtered in with questions about whys and whys not, why haves and blah, 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 that becomes dangerous. Yeah. Hmm. That becomes like a, a scenario where you go, oh, hang on a second here. We're, we're starting to create a voice and a thinking process that is actually not only dangerous to the, to the tithe, but dangerous to the stabilization of the hive as well. And not to say yeah. that it would destabilize Gothel's needle, but it would de- definitely destabilize 
the other hives around. And that's that leads me quite nicely into another point I was going to talk about as well, is the idea that um, Gothel's Needle would almost be, I don't know, a, a, a myth, for use of a better term, or a, a hive that's talked about where people go, you know, they, they do have democracy there. You know what I mean? They go, what the hell does that look like? What's that? Yeah, I'm glad you've brought this part up because it would definitely be something people would be talking about in the same sort of uh, way that they'd be like, oh, you know, uh, um, you, go, you go down hive there, uh, you, you, you can, you, you'll be eaten by cannibals. It's like, yeah, okay, I've, I've, I've heard the myths about, the rumours about cannibals and that, is it true? Oh, yeah, you go down there, you go... You walk around a corner, boom, cannibals. You walk into a room, yep, there's cannibals. It would just sort of be like, you go to Gothel's Needle, oh, man, yeah, democracy. Oh, it's insane. And there would be so much disinformation coming out about democracy and that because you've got to remember the group of them that would be pro-democracy versus the group of them would be anti-democracy would all be spreading misinformation about each other. And yeah, it's, it's going to be a sort of, yeah, a myth is the same, at the same, a lot of it's going to be fake news. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, a hundred percent. And then, but you, you mentioned something there that just sparked something inside my brain there about the idea that are they promoting Gothel's needle outside of Gothel's needle? You know what I mean? Are they, uh, do you have people spruiking it or, is it something that they surely that Lord Helmore would be putting the kibosh on anybody talking about? Oh, Helmore would be Helmore would be spearheading the the myth, the disinformation about it. You can't go there. You can't even walk down the street without you know other people telling you it's okay. Oh, what's that? You want you wanna you wanna set up a manufactorium and the needle? Oh, okay. What? So you just don't want to make any money because you've got to you have to pay taxes up to, to the clan houses and the great houses and then a bunch of citizens. No. And then they can shut you down whenever they want because exactly. they have yeah. the rule. Yeah. And technically that's all true, but yeah. it would be really over dramatized in that respect to, mm. to, to sort of yeah, to really fake news it up, basically. Um so yeah, I think I agree. It would there would be a certain element of myth and almost legend to it um mm. i think the main positive stuff would be coming from citizens from your everyday drudging class person where they can go hold on if i go to the needle i can be more than i am here yeah right um, yeah. Yeah. but the downside is i've got to go all the way to the other side of the planet and that's dangerous yeah so will any, i make it yeah yeah Anyone who gets there, um, I genuinely think they're probably real hard nuts to get from another hive to the needle. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's. I think it'd be it'd be very strange. It'd be a very strange concept to hear. It's like if someone told you about a community where you weren't allowed to use the letter E. Yeah. Okay. Know, yeah. Yeah. That yeah, would. That would bad it's so alien. <laughs> I see what you're for trying to do. you. That would bad for you. <laughs> or you could say that would wasp for you instead of bee, because that's like the opposite of bee. That would be bad for you. That would be wasp for you. I prefer you saying delacqua to making those <laughs> sorts of jokes. It's pronounced delacqua, uh, not delacqua. 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 <laughs> um, yeah, no, yeah. I think I think it'd definitely be a lot of uh, like high level shit talking from people to keep you away from Gothel. Mm, yeah, and I I think it would be to to ensure that they maintain that the the sense that Gothel's needle is is a place you you don't really want to get to and you don't want that information coming out and you know to to have that spread would obviously Helmore just said and in the read it says. You know, they, they, they really don't like the idea of Gothel's Needle. Uh, and the only reason it can maintain is because it ticks its boxes. 
yeah. for the Imperial House. It says, yep, we're still doing what exactly what you asked us to do. But I guess we'll move on to the next point of that read as well, which I thought was really cool, is that the, the clan houses have been told, keep, keep a leash on your members. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's hard to imagine, like I said before, it's hard to imagine someone telling the clan houses to keep it together. Like, just remember that you're not in charge here. Mm. We are. And you can imagine, especially of all the houses, I imagine Escher not dealing with this well. Um, Because unless the citizen council is made up of women, they're not going to appreciate a man telling them you can't do that here. Yeah, or somebody just saying, oh, you're trying to go for maximum control and power and be the most dominant king, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. You, you pay credence to what we do first, and then, then we will allow you to do what you want to do. But I think it's cool that even though these have their clan houses are being told, you know, Keep it together, you know. Don't don't cause waves. You can be here, but you gotta be working for us still effectively. Um, you actually mentioned before uh, about Vansar, and Vansar has a huge presence in Gothril's Needle. Um, and according to House of Artifice, uh, there's a reading here that hundreds of House Vansar enclaves are seated throughout Necromunda. And most hives have at least one small community of members of the House of Artifice. One of the larger enclaves can be found in Gothril's Needle on the far side of the planet from Hive Primus. Here, the members of House Vansar are closely linked to the Hive's ruling council, who follow strange democratic ways. It is the Vansar who are responsible for the great Numerologia that takes votes from the Hive's 88 million citizens each one able to have their say on everything from when the hive's great storm shielding should be replaced to how many ration slices each councillor is allowed during a session of the Gothril Council. So often a vote's cast and on such a wide variety of subjects that many citizens feel they do little more than vote and it is a wonder that the hive meets its production quotas at all. To facilitate all this voting, the Vansar created the great Numerologia, yes. an army of spider-legged servitors data slaved to a single mother servitor that roamed the hive taking votes and squawking the results back to their mother. It is not a perfect system. House Delark agents are known to hack the servitors or substitute them with their own to skew a vote. While many claim House Vansar's control of the Numerologia allows it to rig the vote as they please, it is only the layers of bureaucratic chaos between a vote being cast and anything coming of it that makes any effort to subvert the machine largely meaningless. Yeah, right. So the classic 40k environ where something happens, but add a decade to it before before that action can truly take place. We've sent reinforcements to this war zone. Yeah. What do you mean the war was over five years ago? Yeah, exactly. Like, we lost. Yeah. Um, that's, that's it. Like, it's... This is the level of insanity that's coming even from the ability to vote. Yeah. Where many citizens... It's, firstly, the, we've been given a pretty firm number there of 88 million citizens. I... I heard that as well. It's nice to hear firm numbers. You don't really hear it a lot in a lot of what we read. So is that just the hive? Is that the uh, that's just the upper hive? That can't be the under hive. It can't be. I was thinking it. Eighty-eight million seems small for this do you, planet. Do you yeah. think that's just the people between the wall? Sort of, you know, that every hive seems to have between the under hive and the hive proper. Mm. Do you think the middle it's class just? Hive. Yeah. Do you think it's just the middle class? Um, that is 88 million, that they're the ones that vote? I would say so. I, I, I think it would be because the, the underhive would be a constantly fluctuating number, you know, and you know, we know from what we've read that there's still a gang war, go, still gang wars going down in the underhive. 
the upper spires and the upper hive, mate, they don't care. They they they've got their council that does it all. You know. Yeah. So they they they're relying on the raw data coming from the middle class hive. That's well, officially its slurical title as well, middle class hive. The middle class hive, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Yeah. What was the fellow's name from before? Um, Sitch Gavros. Um, yeah. It's it says there that the underhive, the you know, the criminal elements run rife in the mm. lower levels. That Sitch Gavros is the most powerful of the Delark overlords. He's he's turning the underhive of the needle from the way I interpret this into your classic Necromunda war zone. Mm. And um that's why I think it's just that middle class, that eighty eight million who live between the upper spire and the lower hive. They're yeah. the ones making all these votes, and um, well, they I mean, would the, be the they would be the ones guiding the um the production. Sorry, what were you going to say? No, 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 no. But, um, they would be the ones guiding the production, so they would be the one the workers. They're the ones who are filling the manufactorums. They're the ones you know sitting there ensuring that the technology is maintained. They're the ones sitting in their educational classes and picking the best of the best for them. So they're the ones the squawking spider servitors coming up to them and saying, <laughs> You'll have to vote. Yeah. Um, that's horrific. <laughs> Imagine how when you mentioned that, I thought, how god awful would that be? Every day you leave your little hab unit, you have to vote on what this time? Are we using brown sugar or white sugar in the coffee? Okay, I don't care. You have to vote. Okay, brown sugar. There you go. Done. Every day. And then, uh, so we're deciding whether we should have coffee or tea. <laughs> oh, I, I, I don't care. I, I have to make these bolter shells. Yeah. You have to vote. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you know, violation, violation. Citizen <laughs> did not vote. Um, <laughs> Gets taken yeah. away. That's that freedom we're talking about. It just vanishes. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you don't the, vote. We got gotcha. you. That's an excellent point. Yeah. You have the right to vote, but if you don't vote, you can't do anything until you vote. Yeah, that's, true. That's yeah. a great example of you have less freedom. Right. That would. That's actually really cool because yeah, if the if you're not like say if you miss one vote, they go okay. You know maybe the spider servitor went kaputski or something. But, and it would be funny as well because it would be like, you'd say if you miss 10, 15 votes, they would eventually come for you, but it would take them ages to come for you. So yeah. it might be 10, 15 votes you missed, I don't know, a decade ago, two decades ago, or it might be your father's 10, 15 votes that were missed, you know? So that <laughs> by the time the wheels turn, they come over there like, here you go, we've yeah. got you. And you're like, well, those, those people don't live here anymore. Well, bad luck. It's, You're going to prison. Um, yeah. I imagine it like in, uh, uh, is it Terminator? Where he's like Sarah Connor. Yeah. And oh. it's just the wrong Sarah Connor and she just gets arrested. And then it's yeah. like, well, they're just arresting everyone named Sarah Connor. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, it, yeah. you know, in population of 88 million, it's about 11 yeah. Sarah Connors. Um, yeah. And the actual Sarah Connor emigrated back to Hive Primus. Yeah. <laughs> Many, many moons ago. Many, many years ago. And by the time it takes for those people to, I don't know, get get released, that's probably another four or five years down the track sort of thing. Yeah. So it's, it's this this ridiculous bureaucracy. And that's something we haven't touched on within this hive. Uh, because of the the way that the other hives would be run, you would have the gangs running their enclaves. You would have then the Palinite, Palatine the Palanites causing grief for them, but maintaining the rule of Helmore. Then you would have the noble houses running their shenanigans. And it, mm. there's, there's a real, there's a, a process to that hierarchy. Whereas within this, it would just be a soup of bureaucracy and it would be just God awful. I, I could imagine they would probably be the largest users of servitors within all of Necromunda. They would have to be. Well, just the the fact they've talked so much about the fact that there is automation. Mm. Yep. I, yep. in my mind, yeah, there would be so many servitors in this hive. Um, and then you've got, you know, these squawking spider servitors. Yeah. And then the giant mother. Um, 
of the numerologia. Now, it's oh, I want to I want to build that. I want to build this I, giant pile just, of like spider servitors yeah. and um, have it massive. Have it like that section is two by two. Like it's a two by two board just covered yeah. in these spider servitors, and yeah. for you to be, you know, you're you're playing a Delac gang, and I'm playing a my Van Sar, and you're just like you're trying to destroy it. I'm trying yeah. to protect it. Like it'd be an insane board. Do you know what I would do instead? Rather than try and destroy it, you just have like say uh, an Orlock gang and an Escher gang. And you're just trying to get in there to change your vote from three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I want to vote, no. Brown sugar just tastes better. <laughs> yes. You're actually um, just, just trying to get in just to get find that one little scaring of data. Yeah. I have come up with a mission you could play based in the Gothrill's Needle, just from what you've said then. Yeah. Um. What I would do is uh, it would be only for your leader. So you take your leader and um, you can only equip them with, let's say, a sidearm or a knife or something like that. Um, and uh, you would basically be debating each other. So roll a d6 every turn, right? Yeah. And I wonder if that would work. Yeah, roll a d6 every turn, and um, you just can't roll a six. Because as soon as you roll a six, you're going to pull your sidearm, and you're going to shoot at the opponent. Oh, yeah. And um, as soon as you do that, you're going to disrupt the vote that's taking place, because you're debating party policy on this one here, sort of, you know, trying to get your representative elected and as soon as you pull that gun and you shoot um the enforcers you're gonna you're gonna need like i don't know six enforcers and they're gonna try and arrest you and you've effectively got to get to a designated point on the other side of the table as the exit point so you can get back into the hive and get away from these enforcers yeah um And in true Australian fashion, I would call this mission Democracy Manifest. <laughs> and the enforcers, because anyone who knows this video, you're going to understand this reference here. Um, the enforcers know their judo well, sir. And yes. yeah, they're going to try and arrest you for disrupting democracy. Yeah. Um, and it'd be it'd be such a weird mission. I'm I'm gonna write this down. And yeah, write it down. I, I I like it because the idea that um the sidearm now becomes the most powerful weapon there because the enforcers would only know their judo skills, so they'd be unarmed. Yeah. They'd be grabbing at you. Yeah, they'd be grabbing at you. Um, and so you might have a blade and something that be can be secreted onto your gang leader, a pistol, a blade. That is all. Um. And then I don't know, maybe have like digi lasers. Maybe digi, digi lasers. lasers, yeah, yeah, or digi digi bolt rounds. Digi um, bolt round. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna come up with the rules for that, the old digi bolt round. Um, but then you could, what you could also have is you could have like people listening to the debate that would be drawn to your leader side and be like, no, oh. we're gonna get the leader out, you know. So and they jump on board with, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's genius. And whichever leader wins and gets out, one of their prizes should be a succulent Chinese meal. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I was just trying to think how you would do a succulent Chinese meal. <laughs> I um, it would be. Three... Three D six times five credits. Yeah, no, no, make they, a meal like their next, uh, their, their next fight. Yeah. They oh, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a full banquet. Yeah, it's a um, full, full banquet. They get a full Chinese meal would be perfect. Yeah, we're gonna have to write these down, man, and um, 
just add them to our pile of tangents that we create, <laughs> our, little, our little talking points that we have had people say, write them down and come back to them. Um, we are, I think we're quite prolific at just going down these carried holes and just going, oh, well, hang on, we've got to stay on target. Um, so, yeah, we'll write it down, add it to the pile, and hopefully we can revisit it in some way, shape, or form in the future. We can do like a uh, a recap episode. Of, yeah. Do you remember in episode one where Nathan went on a 14-minute tirade about how he wants to do this? Or do you remember yeah. in episode two where Cam was just talking about this and everyone was like, yeah, we should do that? Like, uh, oh, what was that? Um, get to the top of the tower. To, uh, yeah. Sawtooth Harlot style. Sawtooth Harlot, oh, yeah. Pull one cool. out for my girls. Um, or even, even just one of our tangents that I, I enjoyed was talking about what a census looks like on Necromunda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that to me is an hour long episode talking about a yeah. census on Necromunda. Because yeah. um, uh, can the Goliath even like put an X here if you exist? Yeah. Um, you know, do, they, do they count <laughs> as just one person? Yeah. Um, Man, we've talked a lot this episode. Um, we have, we have. But I, I think it's all justifiable because the, these two hives, are, and, and rightly so, they are, they're very different to many of the other hives out there. So it's actually really important that we, we drill down into these a little bit more. Mm. Um, and as I said, we, we do this because we love it, but for us as well, we learn a lot um, as, we, as we're talking about these hives. Oh, man, I really want to talk about how insane the concept of some of these gangs would be within these hives. Like we talked about it earlier about the mortis things and I'm definitely going to do that dead boys gang at some point. Um, <clears throat> my, my chain mail clad dead boys gang is going to, it's just going to be my absolute favorite thing. I'll add that after what's next. Um, I've got the Scions of goth mm -hmm. and I've got my corn Escher that are sitting here yeah. Um, I've got my squats in front of me. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, you need to mention <laughs> your squats. <laughs> I have so much to do. Um, what's a gang you'd do from Gothril's Needle? Gothril's Needle? Well, honestly, and it, it, it's pretty vanilla uh, for me, uh, the, 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 the Goliath lads. The Titan, like... Titan works? The Titan work lads, they just sound really cool. You could, because the project you would have is, you know, a lot of the Goliath models, the actual miniature itself is quite haunched over. You know, mm. they're all sort of like real shoulder heavy and, you know, sort of a little bit too top heavy. This, I think you would have to find a range of miniatures that would be standing a little bit more upright, um, move away from from the red plated armor and the spikes and all that and have really smooth integrated armor plates, uh, get rid of the mohawks, all shaved head, uh, clean shaven, not too many hanging chains or anything like that. And some really cool looking weaponry, not just this agricultural looking weaponry, but even just their shotguns would look, you know, just that little bit extra classy, a little bit more tech orientated. Yeah. Oh, the, um, those new space Marine scouts, Yes. They would have some parts that I would thieve real quick for the Titan works. Yes, um, absolutely. And, oh, yeah, I, I'm guessing lots of Space Marine heads. You want them all bald? Um, yep. Uh, and oh, how would you do their armor? Like, I'm just casually cruising the Games Workshop website. I'm like, <laughs> what would I use? For Titan works, I'm serious, man. Um, the Stormcast Eternals. Yes, there you go. That would look really cool. Because I was actually thinking about the armor, and this is probably something tr that you would be able to relate to. Is I imagine their armor like the power armor from Fallout. Um, yeah, where these these like really Baroque and interlocking type of armor plates, but even fancier than that. So shinier, um, a lot more work done on them. And so Stormcast Eternals would look really good. Plus they're all standing really tall. Yeah, those are the Vindictors, the guys with the spears and shields. Um, yeah. You tech up their armor, get some servos through the legs. Mm. Um, they'd obviously still have their, like the chem synths and that sort of thing on them. 
like yep. that that really describes like because they're gleaming bald he- bald heads and immaculate forge suits. Yeah, that's really a way I would be going with that sort of look. Maybe the praetors where they've got the the cloaks over their shoulders and that would be cool. That would be really cool cloaks on these guys as well. It sort of yeah, it it, it, it throws to the the non functional aesthetics that you have within 40k you know like banner poles and stuff like that which i love i love all that in 40k but they're non-functional they're within like no no person in their right man's are all walking into a battlefield with that but these goliath would imagine themselves as the pinnacle of fighting of a fighting force so they would sit there and be like yeah well we're cloaks because we're, we're the best yeah. of the best yeah like the the vanguard hunters yeah. from the Stormcast Eternal range. They're real mm. dynamic too. Mm. And they've yeah. got like the the hanging leather sort of loincloth um, yeah. sort of skirts as well. Like, yeah. man, yeah, that you could do cool. some... And you just, you neck them under them up a little bit. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you give them an extra bit of governs. And who was it one, I remember you telling me there's every miniature's a Necromunda model. Every, yeah. every model's a Necromunda model. <laughs> um but yeah, that that would be really cool. But I think the other thing with the gang like that is you'd you'd have to play them as a bit of elitist. You know what I mean? So you would definitely they would be close combat orientated and they'd be hard nuts. But you wouldn't be going for any skills or abilities that reflects them as like just you know meatheads who just want to thump things. Yeah. You you'd have to play them like choosing your skills, choosing your weapons, and so forth as a gang who is. Their strength is their martial prowess, not their the fact that they're just really strong. Yeah, no, you definitely focus them on combat. Like you'd mm. want them, you'd want them to be, yeah, not just I'm going to smash you with my hammer, but mm. I'm going to parry your blow and then take out mm. your legs from underneath you, and then while you're on the ground, I'm going to smash yeah. you with my hammer. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Once I've made it look really yeah. cool, that's when I'm going to bludgeon you to death. Yeah. And speaking of hammers, uh, I know exactly what you should be using for your champions in your Titanworks gang. The uh, man, I, I'm going to. I think I might end up starting a Stormcast Eternal army. Um, the Annihilators with meteoric grand hammers. There's yeah, a guy. Right. He's got like a bear chest plate. Like it looks yeah. like the head of a bear, and it is awesome. Cool. Yeah. That is really cool. Um, and that's something you could see easily reflected in Necromunda as well. Like they would have this type of iconography and so forth that would be on them and just be like, and you could even say like within their part of the Titan works, they're known as the, you know, the bear clan of the Titan works and blah, blah, yeah. blah. Yeah. Um, um, the, you know, the sun, sons of the, is it Ursine is uh, there? Ursa? Ursa, yeah, Ursa. Sons, yeah. sons of the Ursa. Yeah. You know, there you go. Boom. There's your particular sub faction of the um of the Titan works. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Like that would yeah, work those, very those well. Massive. I I want some of those. So though yeah, those uh stormcasts you're talking about are freaking mad. And one that I found that I think is absolutely bonkers and wants to be a Necromunda miniature is the Lord Ordinator. So he's he's actually, I don't know, I guess he's an engineer of some description, but the cool thing about him is he's actually got bare arms and he's clearly got non-metallic oh gauntlets. Um, so he he looks like an upstanding Goliath. You know, I the only thing I would do aesthetically-wise on these is change their booties a little bit and just have their yeah. feet a little bit different. But this guy, this guy looks like a forge master. You know, he's got all the bits hanging off him. He's got the 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 heat retardant sort of loincloth cloak type thing. Yeah. Um, he's yeah. Got, is it like the sextant yeah. belt yeah. buckle thing there? Get yeah. rid of that, replace it with either the the image of the Titan, uh, the human, the giant human silhouette of the Titan works, or yeah. the Goliath skull. and Or even wha- your bear, a bear head on there. Oh, yeah, go you know, on. Is, where did it come from? Yeah. These um, would be absolutely sick. I actually, like, legitimately am thinking about doing this game, not just as an idea, but... Are like, you doing it for Akramanda? Because <laughs> you got to remember, from this point of release, you have four weeks. I, I, I have faith. 
I believe in me. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad one of us does. <laughs> anyway, what would your uh, what would your game be that you would uh, try to derive out of Gothril's needle? Oh no, it's now the Titan works. One hundred percent. I think we're both building uh, <laughs> Stormcast Eternal's army. Um, <laughs> the volunteer citizen enforcers. Um, I I think they're. I think they'd be great to play because um, it would, you know, the Cities of Sigma uh, army box that came out a little while ago um, with the new sort of like human infantry. Yes. So I managed to pick up a squad of those infantry. Did you really? Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, man. Um, they were then, um, they were uh, they're a hot ticket. Those they are so cool, and they've got like there's just they're just regular people, and you've got like all these different bare heads and helmeted yeah. head options, and that just various close combat weapons. But you replace those with uh, like the hive scum kit, auto guns, mm. or mm. some las guns, uh, bolters, that sort of thing, shotguns. And, yeah, throw some tech on them. And they look yep. uniform enough to say, yeah, we're, we're mm. the same group, but they're not, you know, classy enough to be seen as real enforcers. Yep. Yep, um, yep. I think that'd be great. Really do them as, like, this citizen militia that yep. have come from all these different walks of life. Make some of them look like obvious former gangers, that sort yeah. of thing. Um, that would be cool. Yeah. And that's, that's as simple as a head swap. You know what I mean? So you put a a particular gang's head or whatever, like an Orlock head or something on there and just be like, yeah, this one used to be an Orlock, but decided they wanted to be part of our, our citizen militia. And we watch over him a little bit more because he hasn't got the lineage behind him. But um, you would definitely yeah. have, you would definitely have, oh, I can't think of it, the name of it. It's the... It's like a town crier style t- style thing in Necromunda where he's got the two TV screens and he's got the the, oh, the um, either side of him. Yeah. propagandist, is it? Yeah, you would definitely have one of them in the gang. Just like walk around, just to like follow the rules, people. This is this, you know, we're we're here for you if you do the wrong thing. We're also here for you if you need our help. You know. Oh, that's a really good idea. Um, you know, you, yeah, yeah. You could also mix in. You'd try and make them look a little bit like uh, the Ashwood Stranger, where you know they've got sort of non-enforcer looking gear. Um, was it the propagandist? Yeah, it's propagandist, isn't it? With the screens, yeah, and the big, yeah, he's yeah, got yeah. The big speakers yep. either side of his head, but he's clearly deaf. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you from, throw from in the speakers yeah. from the speakers. Throw yeah. in a couple of um you know, maybe rebreathers and that hanging off their neck and, yep. you know, they've, they've gathered gear here and there. So, mm. yeah, yeah, that's the gang I'd do. Um, and then I would run away from your Titan works. <laughs> uh, Just these, these beautiful, like, armoured up, bald-headed Adonises marching yeah. through uh, Gothel's Needle. Mm. Every one of them looks uh, like that picture of Alfarius in front yeah. of the um, the uh, Alpha Legion guys, where they're all identical and they're yeah, all yeah. just beautiful, and you're like, yeah. "Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. I'm not fighting them. I'm pretty yeah. sure they are Astartes. <laughs> no, they're just yeah. perfect Goliath." Um, yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly <laughs> what they would look. Like. I, I'm so yeah. I know the picture you're talking about. You just show me that. But. Um, yeah, that's exactly, and it would just be the the presence of them would be intimidating enough. Yeah, you know? no. oh. as, as, and we've already mentioned it. That's a I totally believe that was a, a machination of the council was to create a a terror army. So, but yeah. Anyway, well, um, that's been a lot of conversation about mm-hmm. just two hives. I I don't want to look at the time. Um, <laughs> so, closing thoughts. Um, Mortis or Gothral? Where do you want to live? Ah. <laughs> That's not a question. 
Plague zombies or spider servitors constantly telling you you have to vote? Oh, mate, give me 10 million of those spider servitors a week. I'll handle that over the idea that something that I kicked two minutes ago is coming now to stalk me from behind and bite me on the neck. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm good. I'm definitely living in Gothel's Needle, mate. Jesus Christ. What kind if of I want to get stalked and randomly bitten, I'll spend time with my children. <laughs> um, no, you're, you are absolutely right. It's Gothrill's Needle every day of the week. Yeah. Look, I, I think it's, it's these two hives are a really good um, contrast to each other. Um, there, there's some similarities and, that we can see that we, we touched upon, but I think they're a great place to start. And mm. um, obviously this will be an ongoing series for us as well, uh, touching on the other hives and just seeing how they reflect and you know, what, what ideas we can come up with regard to them. But I think doing these two first is a, some really good talking points for us. And they, they're because they are so iconically different as well in the sense that, you know, the the management and political system within uh, Gothel's Needle is so vastly different to everything else on Necromunda. And yeah. then just the fact that Mortis is empty, you know, that is what its point of difference is to everything else that goes on in Necromunda as well. So good place to start i think and uh can't wait to do our next episodes on the hives um i wonder if we'll do secundus on one of the next ones hmm. people may never know <laughs> feels like you're giving it away plus it would be our second series so it would make sense to do secundus because that's number two it is number two um, yes Maybe. See, the, the imperial yeah. education system worked on me. Yeah. Two. <laughs> You're just banging your head against the table. One, two. Yep, two. that's it. Got it. I'm learned. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're going to wrap this one up. And before we go to our quote, I just want to remind everyone that our competition will be going as of right now, when you're hearing this. And... As we're getting an episode out roughly every two, and actually I think it's been exactly every two weeks, um, you'll have two episodes from now until we announce a winner. And in case you remember, there were a lot of steps, and it's follow us on Instagram, like this status, or this post. This post, yes. Like this post, and just tell us what gang you want to start. And... When I say what gang, I mean any of any of the Necromunda gang boxes. So Ashway Snowmat, Corpse Grinders, Cordor, Delark, Esher, Goliath, Orlok, Vansar, Squats, Enforcers. If you want to start any of them, just tell us that's the one you want to start. And we'll select someone completely at random and we'll just get you that box. It's that simple. Easy as. No problem, yeah. unless you're planning on doing uh, the Titan. What are the, sorry, the Titan works. The, the Titan work. Unless you're planning on doing the Titan works, Goliath. Then yeah, that might be a bit more difficult. Then we'll send you a box of Goliath. Um, oh yeah, the Goliath. Did I say Goliath? I don't think you did actually. But yeah, yeah we we will be sending you whatever. If you gang. want to do. If you want to do Goliath, we will send you Storm... Sorry, if you want to do Titanworks, we will send you Stormcast Eternals. No, we won't. <laughs> no, we won't. I do will not send you a that. random Stormcast Eternal. Um, <laughs> no, it's that simple. Just follow us on Instagram, like the post, tell us what gang you want to start, and randomly one of you is going to be getting that gang box. Sounds cool. And jumping into, as the way we like to finish an episode, a quote. And this one here comes to us from the 2023 Call Rulebook. Shantytown springing up around effluent runoff. Holsteads jammed into cracks between hive levels. Trading combines clinging to junctions between domes. If there's a bit of unclaimed space and something of value you can scrape off the walls or dig out of the scrap, you can be sure hivers will find a way to live there. And that's Dark Drummer, an oath-broken bounty hunter. And that was our latest episode of the Underhive Lawkeepers podcast. I am Spamil, and on behalf of the Lawkeeper team, thank you for listening. Please follow us on Instagram, and don't forget to follow and review us on your preferred podcast platform. 
As always, if you have questions, complaints, corrections, or need travel advice for your next Hive Mortis vacation, please reach out to us at underhivelawkeepers at gmail.com. Thanks.